Very Members, Madam Speaker. Prayers. Almighty God, we in Hindu and for this awareness of both the decision leaders and parliaments for the society and just government humanity. We beseech you to look upon with the abundance of this your servants, whom we've been pleased for the performance of such important trust in this land. Let your blessings send upon you assembled and gathered may in your presence. Fit and consider matters of family deliberation. You soldiers and fellow men promote your hand and glory and to advance the good of those whose interests you have committed to your church. Amen. Item number two, communication from the chair. Honorable members, I want to welcome you to today's sitting. And I want to express my gratitude to you for the great work you're doing for Parliament. I have seen so many committees are working, people are in the field, people are in sports. You're everywhere. Thank you so much. Colleagues, We've learned with the sadness of the demise of the following persons this week. Uh, Mr. Mazur Alan, the owner of Casements. I know most of you know him. He has contributed so much to the economy of Uganda. And uh, he has been very instrumental in the revival of Uganda Manufacturers Association. We have also learned the demise of uh, Mr. Robert Elangot, the former deputy governor. 
of the Bank of Uganda. He served the Bank of Uganda from 1971 to 1981. And then as, as a banking, as a secretary to the bank. And then he also served as a deputy governor for some years. So he has been very instrumental in the banking industry. And members, I would request as a house, as usual, that we rise and observe a moment of silence in memory of them. May their soul rest in eternal peace. Members, I also want to inform the house that uh, our she cranes, the girl child, are in Namibia and they are doing very well, very, very well. And we expect good results from the she cranes as we keep praying for them. They will be, they will bring the trophy home. So keep them in prayers. I've also got a communication from opposition chief whip, designating Honorable Mbazira Bashir to represent opposition in the delegation of African, Caribbean and, uh, Caribbean and Pacific, EU, and uh, Hassan Kironda in OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries. So, those members are designated to those committees. I want to thank you again so much. But I also want to ask the House, ask members, I want you to be very careful. I have just seen a bus when I was coming in, being blown out around in Piggy. So we need to be very careful in places we go to, people we interact with, and we also need to tell the people outside there to be very careful. I think there is some, something that we don't know that is happening, that we may need to know. It's not an easy time, but we need to be very careful. I want to thank you so much. Yes, procedure. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. One, I want to appreciate you for a good job always, but also to appreciate the colleagues on both sides. You've just touched on a very, very pertinent matter, on an issue of security. And if indeed a blast, at, a blast has taken place within our borders, <laughs> I felt it was very, very important that this house is given ad adequate information. And therefore, I wanted to ask whether it's not procedurally proper that we demand for information from the relevant ministry, because it concerns issues of safety, not only of the members, but uh, the entire public. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Silas, government. You know, I get so, before the minister speaks, much as I appreciate, we appreciate that we, we are observing the SOPs, but we cannot have a front desk really so empty like this. It is unacceptable. It is really a shame to us. Hmm? It is a shame to us. I don't know what the, the appointing authority thinks when he looks at like this. Because we have so many of these backbenchers who wanted to be here. Honorable members, honorable members, 
I was only expressing my disappointment. And it's not for debate. I was expressing my disappointment. It is so bad. Uh, Honorable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, you have just broken our hearts Proceed with, Madam with Speaker. a story. Proceed, Madam Speaker. Let him give us a... Let Madam you. Speaker, I've recently risen on the point of procedure, whether we are proceeding well because the matter that you have communicated to the Agas House is a very, very important matter. And with the submission of my neighbor colleague, Honorable Silas, I don't think whether we are proceeding well because the Honorable Minister has no any knowledge concerning the security. The fact even if they shoot a bullet, he can run and hide. I don't know, Madam Speaker, I don't know whether we are proceeding well. Honorable, Honorable if, uh, Macho, Honorable Macho, members, for me, my, what I'm interested in, what we are interested in is a response from government. That is what we're interested in. And whether it is from who, but from government. And government is responding. Government, can you respond? Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the wise ruling. Madam Speaker, you have just announced a heartbreaking story. And this is not the first time, neither the second time. I cannot guarantee that it will be the, the last time. But what we can uh, guarantee is that the relevant security agencies and the relevant minister will come to the house and give a comprehensive statement from government. Thank you. Members, as I said before, as we wait for a report, whether the report is coming, we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. We need to tell our communities to be careful with the people that they deal with. If somebody is coming with something that you're suspicious, that should be reported. Yes. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, right Honorable Speaker, while we have made uh, great strides in our fight against coronavirus, it is still a major concern. Right Honorable Speaker, I would uh, like you to rule as to whether we are proceeding well with some members on the government side sitting in the house without uh, masks over their mouth. I can see a member, she's now putting on. So. <laughs> Thank you, right uh, on. I have not seen anybody put, uh, not putting on a mask. And uh, if you are not putting on a mask, please ensure that we follow the SOPs. The person I saw alternates because she's expecting. We don't want to suffocate our baby. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Talk about insecurity, Madam Speaker. The M23 movement, those rebels have uh, attacked and they are in a serious fighting in the RSC. And uh, so many refugees, in fact, the first of its kind, the influx is huge. They have entered and even humanitarian workers and our Ugandan officials are overwhelmed by the numbers. And therefore they have even abandoned the screening of these uh, people that are coming. And that is a serious health insecurity because one, they're ravaging COVID-19, they are not testing for it. 
to you know the outbreaks severe ones of Ebola have been emanating from the RRC. And they are here in their thousands, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we need a statement and an urgent one. This is a matter of urgent public importance on the state of affairs as we talk, Madam Speaker. Second, and very brief, Madam Speaker, it's a follow-up of uh, the statement that was the leader, the leader of the opposition. The, that statement that was made here on his behalf by the Shadow Minister of Works and Transport on uh, the presidential directives that are arbitrary and uh, that are in total contravention of the established law, especially on contractual obligations of infrastructure developments in Uganda. Madam Speaker, you directed that uh, the land attorney general would come to this house and give a legal opinion on these uh, uh, presidential directives that have contravened the law, that have constituted him so far the office into a PPDA, and have also uh, contravened the Public Finance Management Act and other actual laws and regulations. Madam Speaker, the Attorney General, who was supposed to have come last week on Wednesday, has not shown up at all. Even up to now, there is no sign of him furnishing this house with that opinion, <laughs> Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Minister of Security will need a, a statement on what you have said on the imprint theory comprehensive statement on the situation matters. And then the directives of, uh, of, uh, of presidential directives, since there was the same matter which was raised before and had been referred to the Committee of Infrastructure, I referred that matter to the Committee of Infrastructure that is handling the issue of roads and, and those directives. I am not sure if uh, Attorney General is competent enough to make those follow-ups because they are directed to a ministry. So they will make a report. The report that will come will have an input of the land Attorney General. Matters of national importance, Ronald. Ronald Nakawa. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I'll proceed, your matter. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. We have, you have mentioned something to do with the security in this country. Mindful about that the security forces in this country are mandated to take care of the security of Ugandans and their properties. Right Honorable Speaker, we need to look into all angles which can lead to insecurity uh, in this world, which can lead to insecurity in this country. Of recent, Right Honorable Speaker, the commander of land forces, Honorable, General Mohosta has made it a habit. Honorable Kiwanuka, why are you smuggling in an issue? What we have been talking matter? about insecurity in this country. What right? procedural right. matter are you raising? We have moved to the next item. The next item is matters of national importance. If you have, it is a matter, then you raise it up as a matter. Is that okay? You will raise it as a matter of national importance on that issue. So for now, let's first have Honorable. Ronald. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. My name is Balimwezo Ronald Insuga, Member of Parliament representing Nakawa East Constituency. Right Honorable Speaker, on the 29th day of uh, October, a week ago, 
My area was attacked by unorganized criminal gangs armed with uh, concrete papers, iron bars, and pangas. They hit and injured 18 people from one zone called Mutungo Zone 3 and another five from Zone 2, Mutungo. These people injured the victims and some of the victims had their skulls broken, like uh, Mr. Obongole. Right Honorable Speaker, surprisingly, when the community mobilized and arrested one of them, the gang reorganized, stormed the community, hit up the community, and rescued their counterpart. The, the head of the gang had pangas. Right Honorable Speaker, insecurity is increasing. On Tuesday, the following week, the same group, I suppose, attacked the people of Kasokoso at the neighborhood and injured 18 people terribly. Surprisingly, police is not doing enough. In such circumstances, we expect police to secure the people on their property. But uh, right honorable speaker, police was not available. Majority of them were staging roadblocks, arresting border border riders. And we have also come to note, right honorable speaker, that Nakawa division was given 900 LDUs. But there is a report that 400 of them are doing, are being sold out to private people for money. And, they, and I think General Mbadi is aware of that. So my prayer is one, I want to task the Minister of Internal Affairs to explain to us what extra effort have they put to combat such criminality because that's how criminality begins and it trickles down to other areas like it was in Masaka. Secondly, I want to ask the same minister to tell us, to tell my community the arrangements they have put to make sure that my people are secure. Then the other one I would like to task our parliament to basically help in investigating the, 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 the forces that would be protecting our people. For your information, the parliament does not investigate. I would like to task the minister still to carry out an investigation in that to that effect. Members, so when, you, you. when you have a matter of national importance, don't take all the long time. We have over 20 people who have matters of national importance. We've understood your issue. It's a very serious issue. So bring it briefly, the matter, and then ask government to 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 act on it but also when you have that kind of activity happening in your area make sure that you 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 inform the police inform the security forces on what is happening before you wait to come to the house minister of internal affairs right honorable speaker colleague members of parliament have noted the concerns of honorable right honorable speaker i am the last person to raise the point of order against a colleague especially senior to me professionally when we were in law school they told us how to put on a necktie is it in order for my brother 
to put on a necktie in such a manner. I do not want to describe for purposes of, uh, uh, of protecting the record. Is it not in order for him to reorganize his necktie before he addresses parliament? Honorable Segona. The Honorable Minister is used to you putting on uniform. When you put on uniform, you don't put on a necktie. So, Honorable Minister, it's about substance of a form. Thank you, Honorable Segona. I've been uh, out of neckties for a long time, but I'm learning. Uh, thank you, nevertheless. Um, Honorable Bali Muezo raised the uh, concerns of security in his area, uh, right honorable speaker. I've noted and will verify and return with an answer, but also for the record, I have another version. I don't know if this is a separate incident, but I think it's important to inform the house. I'm informed that on the 1st November, around 1100 hours, you organized the meeting on Balimwezo in your constituency regarding controversy over the football pitch. And uh, during that meeting, uh, the residents became rowdy, uh, destroying property, including a vehicle registration number UAU 174K Toyota Premium. Police was called in to restore order and some people were arrested, Honorable Speaker, Right Honorable Speaker. And these included Obo Fred, Ibrahim Abdullah, Ahim Siwe Vicent, Ulangwa Wilson, and Cheyune Ibrahim. They were charged but released on bail. This may be that incident or it may be different, but I'll find out and revert to the house with better facts. Order, Madam Speaker. Order, Madam Speaker. You're making an order on what? Madam Speaker, <laughs> is it in order for Honorable Mbua Tikamwa, who is not even a chairperson of any committee, not even a vice, to go and sit and pose as if he's in the cabinet of President Yoweri Museveni? Huh? Is he in order, Madam Speaker? Uh, 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 Honorable Macho, because there was a lot of space on the front desk, I allowed him. Uh, I allowed free sitting. Honorable uh, Najumba, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Honorable and Speaker. Remember, let it be matters of national importance. Yes. Something that is really so urgent that it must be resolved. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I raise on the matter of national importance concerning a bomb blast that took place in the Cascade District on 29th October, killing three children. Um, King three children, Pius Chihuahua, aged 12 years, Michael Chienji, for 14 years, and Odong, nine months. This took place in Segalia village, Semto Sub County, Nakaske District. Honorable Speaker, you are much aware that Nakaske District is one of the areas of the Liberation War of 1980s. We've been losing lives due to the explosive devices that were abandoned during the Bolira War. And on this note, Honorable Speaker, I request the Minister of Internal Affairs to give a comprehensive report on this matter and even a way forward, because we are keeping on losing our people. Even last year, an incident happened in Kalagala Parish, Wachato Sub-County, injuring three people, and in Chinyogoga, where we lost our life. So I request the minister, and I'm happy he's around, to give a comprehensive report on this matter. And also I request the government of Uganda to compensate these affected families. I've seen 
I've seen the president of Uganda several times, meeting people like those of Masaka. Honorable Segona, can you please give me the information? Thank you, um, right honorable speaker and the honorable Najuma. Because it is a matter no, of Sarah national importance. The speaker. <laughs> no, no, I said thank you, Madam Speaker, and the Honorable Sir. Okay. Madam. Right, Honorable Speaker, the information on which is critical and is a matter of national importance is something I thought the Minister would have addressed Parliament on. This news circulating on social media of a new bus having been burnt in MPG, uh, and it is scaring enough. I thought the Minister would also advise us whether it is true or just alarming. And that's the information Minister, in relation to bombs. Can you give us a, a clarification on that? It was in my communication because I saw it on social media. So you never know it is just a social media. No, it isn't, uh, right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members. There, there was indeed an incident on Massacre Road at Kamengo, to be exact. Uh, a bus caught fire and the information filtering in at the moment and not yet complete is that she developed mechanical conditions uh, which forced the driver to stop. The passengers alighted, fortunately, but it caught fire nevertheless. The fire tenders are on the way. And once the fire is taken out, we shall verify to know the cause, whether it was uh, something not related to the current threat of terrorism. That is what I can say for now regarding that incident. Yes. Sarah was still on the floor. Procedure on what he has just said. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm raising on a point of procedure after listening from Honorable Barimwezo and now the Honorable from Nakaseke and what the minister has replied. Madam Speaker, I appreciate the concerns of colleagues and the security that is happening behind. Wouldn't it be procedurally right that much as it is a matter of uh, importance, to first sort it from the police there or even other security. And then when it fails completely, then we come and task parliament uh, to say that, because it, it is, I see that it is coming on this, that, and yet some of the things can be sorted even before. Coming here. Much as I appreciate uh, that we can talk for our people, but let's also consider parliamentary uh, time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is it but, procedural? But, uh, right but of course, uh, Honorable, that's what I, I mentioned in my statement to Honorable Ronald, that when such as, uh, an incident takes place, uh, you need to report first to the security agencies. Uh, and, and see what happens. Uh, the issue is, did they report what was the action taken and uh, what is the current situation? That is where the issue is. And of course, you can't stop members from talking about their constituencies. Eh? That's why they are here. Nathan, Nathan, is, is it on the same issue? Yes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thank you so much. Madam Speaker, Parliament is, has a lot of business to do. And uh, one of the reasons why we are making Parliament not become interesting, it's only matters of national importance. And matters of national importance, some of them can be resolved at local what? level. We have even a Thursday where your members should raise their business. I have watched this order paper, Madam Speaker. The bill for NSSF has been here even to this year. I don't know how many times it has appeared on the other paper. And yet this is a matter which should have been resolved for our people. Madam Speaker, I know your office is very good and everybody wants to come there. But this matter is of national importance. 
Hold on what? <laughs> Madam Speaker, I've refused the order. Members, members. <laughs> nice. Nathan, Nathan. <laughs> Ma Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Members, just a minute. Members, let's take this very seriously. We have a congested order paper. And it would be to the interest of the rest of the country to see us debating. Madam Speaker, I had to press. Uh, member, uh, Honorable Silas, I know you have been brought up well, but uh, Sarah, I'm Hon giving only two members. I'm only giving two members. Honorable Speaker, my prayer is that the minister in charge of internal affairs to give a comprehensive report to this house. And secondly, the government to compensate the affected families. May Thank you so much, Honorable, Honorable Minister. It's not just about a comprehensive report, it's an action that you're going to take on the ground. And uh, you'll, you'll bring that next Tuesday. Honorable Segona. Um, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I concur with those that say and insist that uh, we need to seek local remedies where they are available. And two, that matters must be national in character. It is in that spirit that I raise on a point of order, on, of national importance, with respect to management. Honorable Nathan, when you are not in the house, the house is very peaceful. <laughs> and, and that's correct, right, Honorable Speaker. <laughs> and mine is in relation to land management and the ministerial use or otherwise of power. Number one, Article 238 of the Constitution requires that there should be something called the Uganda Land Commission. For the last one month, and this is appointed by the president with the approval of the, this house, parliament, for the last one month, the Minister of Lands, Housing and Urban Development, the Honorable Judith Nabako, purportedly suspended Uganda Land Commission unilaterally and without due process. But that's not enough. A commission, which is a constitutional commission, appointed by the president with approval of parliament, has no provision for intervention or interference by the minister, not under the constitution, not under the land act, not under common sense. Two, a month, a week earlier, had deputy, the minister of state for lands, the honorable Sam Mayanja, had gone to a Chiso zono office closed the government office, locked out staff, and fired them temporarily. Right, Honorable Speaker and colleagues, just today, a video was circulating on social media that the Right Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Robina Nabanja, had grabbed land belonging to orphans which they had occupied prior to their father's death, the Honorable Nabanja sent a contingent of uh, military officers, sealed off the land and fenced it off. These young orphans have walked to police and have not received assistance, not even recording a reference. Prayers, one. May we have, oh, someone is giving me apparently valuable information. I accept it. Thank you very much, honorable colleague, for giving way. As a result of the confusion in the lands ministry and the commission, that commission has not sat for the last one month. And they have not been able to conduct any business and as a result, we, the consumers, 
of the services of that commission have been disadvantaged for purposes of information and to highlight the problem in that place. As we speak now, the chairperson of the Lands Commission and the secretary don't see eye to eye. Nobody can show the other snake. Where would they meet in the first place? Honorable, uh, honorable Sekona, with your before, indulgence. Before you make your prayer, yes. one, uh, for somebody to be appointed as a minister of land has some sense. Because in your statement, you said it's not even with the common sense. For her to be appointed as that minister, there is some common sense she has. So That's, that's so, correct. So it is not you can't use that word. With for, your permission, madam. Okay. It is not just about possession. It includes application and use of the same. And uh, if it was not demonstrated, I beg that you do not compel me to observe it. Right, Honorable Speaker, the functions of the Commission under the Constitution again are to hold and manage any land in Uganda vested in or acquired by government of Uganda in accordance with the provisions of this Constitution and shall have such other functions as may be prescribed by Parliament. We have prescribed those functions under the Land Act and those under the Constitution. The minister went ahead and said, in the meantime, she shall herself execute those functions. So what are your prayers? Prayers, one, for the prime minister and her two ministers to appear in parliament and explain those that egregious abuse of their power. Two, for parliament to urge, actually to compel the ministry to reinstate the commission because the suspension is illegal for want of authority. The president has never had any problem with the commission he appointed and which we approve. The minister cannot usurp the presidential powers. And these are powers which are not delegated under the constitution. I so pray. Uh, thank you. On the issue of the prime minister, the video moving around, I don't know how much you trust what is on the social media. And maybe the other information is you would want to know which police did they report to? What's the reference number where they reported that case? And who are those complainants? There is some kind of social media war that is out there. So you need to come out with all the facts on where they reported and, uh, and uh, who are those people who are on social media. Government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Segona raises specific issues in the Constitution and also goes further to mention the minister responsible for the actions which have been taken. I want to commit that we shall task the minister to come and explain to the House at an earliest opportunity and in any event not later than Thursday this week. Thank you. Uh, the minister should come and report on Thursday. Thank you very much, uh, right honorable speaker. Matters of national importance, Madam Speaker, are supposed to be responded to instantly. But because of the front bench going on unannounced holiday, they end up returning on the order paper as ministerial statements, making our work look shabby. What was supposed to be responded to instantly under our rules becoming a, state, a ministerial statement. I like Honorable Msasi, and I don't doubt his competence. But the appointing authority made him a junior minister. He will make history to become the first acting lead of government business when he's not even a full minister. 
the business, Madam Speaker, that we transact here is government business. <laughs> and that's why under in our rules, they even can have priority over any other matter. So the procedure issue I'm raising, Madam Speaker, if, because on, on a single day, if you look at the budget of parliament, we spend more than one billion shilling every single day. Now, for every matter raised, whenever Musasi says, we are going to ask the minister to come. Then why don't you wait for them and transact business? Madam Speaker, the procedure issue I'm raising, first of all, is whether the Honorable Musasi has been designated lead of government business today. And if he has been designated lead of government business, whether he's proceeding well by not executing that responsibility for every matter appearing, he will go and report. For every matter appearing, he will go and report. <laughs> right, Honorable Speaker and colleagues, the office of Prime Minister is a creature of the Constitution. In fact, it was brought by way of an amendment having recognized that there is a lacuna. There was a lacuna then. And that code 108A provides for that office and provides that the prime minister shall be the leader of government business in the parliament and be responsible for the coordination and implementation of government ministries across ministries departments and other public institutions. Perform such other functions as may be assigned to him or her by the president, or as may be conferred on him or her by the constitution. The prime minister consistently is absent, except when she comes to bring a, a statement. I am also made aware that the president in his wisdom appointed a deputy prime minister who is also the deputy leader of government business. Is it in the same line, procedurally correct, that we keep receiving ministers performing functions which are not conferred by the constitution or the president, in particular parliament, and therefore relegating this house to a secondary position when it is actually their primary responsibility to attend to. Madam Speaker, you can even see the Honorable Musas, even if he has to sit where the Prime Minister has sit, he can't even sit there. Members, I got a communication. <laughs> Members, I got a communication delegating Honorable Musas uh, as a government chief whip. I did not get any communication from from the Prime Minister, and he's acting as a government chief whip, and he's going to deliver the information to the responsible ministers. And uh, of course, we can't suspend the house because people are not here. We need to do our work, but at least a lesson goes out, a warning goes out, that we have so many ministers in the Prime Minister's office, we should add at one time, we have one. We should at least have one representing the prime minister here and uh, perform the role of a prime minister and lead of government business. Procedure, Madam Speaker. Yes. Madam Speaker, thank you so much. Uh, the procedure I'm raising, I just want to give a historical background. In the last parliament, whenever there was no leader of government business and chief whip, Honorable Bahati from Uchigezi in the Kabare was always uh, the one delegate. And now today, I am seeing Honorable Musasi again from Kabare in Uchigezi. <laughs> the, the procedure is I'm raising. Is it the procedure I'm really raising? Is it only cavalry people <laughs> who are capable to lead the house 
it would be delegated when when the prime minister is not around, when the chief whip is not around, and by the way, there are always state ministers. So is it procedure right that they are the only ones? Or wouldn't it be better that the president appoints the people of Kavare to be leaders of government business and the chief whip? Uh, Honorable Nandara, just like the Bible says, the wise people come from the East. Maybe the wise people from the West come from the, his constituency. So it, it, is, it is not by mistake. It's not by mistake that he has replaced, replaced the Honorable Bahati and congratulations for being wise. Uh, honorable members, we are taking a little bit a long time on this. Can we go to the next item? But in the public gallery this afternoon, we have a delegation of women an equal opportunities desk of Moroto Catholic Diocese. They are represented by Honorable Nakut, Faith, and uh, Honorable Chero. You're most welcome. They've come to follow the proceedings of this house. Please stand up for recognition. You're most welcome to this house. They have, there is a motion that is going to be presented by Honorable Nakut on the issues of NAPAC. Welcome. Next item. Item three, statement by Minister on progress in the development of a locally made vaccine for COVID-19 and accountability for the funds released for development of the vaccine. Uh, Madam Honorable Speaker, Minister for Innovation, Technology, Science, Technology and Innovation. Uh, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Science. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, on Thursday, uh, you tasked me that I shouldn't lay myself there because I was a moving encyclopedia. I had all the information. You said you needed papers. And I think it would be procedurally right before the minister or before my colleague, Honorable Minister of Finance, uh, takes up the docket of the Minister of science to give you you give me chance i give him more information or her such that we don't discuss in piecemeal we discuss from an informed point of view since you wanted information please lay the documents i asked you for documentary evidence on the allegations lay the documents on the table and then the minister will come with a response. Thank you. Oh. Madam Speaker. You also tell us the source of the document, where you got it from. <laughs> Madam Speaker. As a member of parliament and dear colleagues, I know our oversight law does not only stop on talking, but it goes ahead to help government, help my party in discovering some of these irregularities. And that is the more reason why with no resource, I offered myself to bring you all this information for the consumption of this house. And I think I should be protected, not intimidated to be asked where I got the information, but the information is here. You can go ahead and find the truth about it. You, you, can't, you can't say, uh, actually that is an intimidation on a speaker. <laughs> yeah? I am asking, I want the source where the information. For instance, if you're saying where is the source of this, this is from a clerk's office. 
if it is from whistleblower, I've mentioned it's from whistleblower, if it's from the ministry, it is from the ministry. Madam Speaker, I cannot intimidate the office of, I mean, the chair of the speaker. I didn't mean that, but what I meant, Madam Speaker, when I came here the other time and I talked about this, when I was going home, I was followed by an unknown two vehicles, double cabins, trying to intimidate me. I didn't mean that your office is intimidating me, not at all. Uh, Honorable Yona, nobody will intimidate you. If you're giving facts, that's what we are saying. Give us the facts to what you know. Thank you. Madam Speaker, the first information, the first paper I want to lay here on the table is evidence to prove that what I was talking about the other time was true with empirical evidence showing the 31 billion which was first released to that organization called Preside under the directorship of the minister now, Honorary Minister Msenero. And this is the budget we appropriated to her and the money was released to her. And that is uh, overview of the budget and release financial year 0, 2016, 2017, 2021, 2022. I beg to read this one. Madam Speaker, I want to lay on table a summary of project budget allocations. When this money was sent to preside, it is purported that she preside this vast money to a group of scientists, of which some of them have denounced themselves and they dissociated themselves from the so-called money that came to them. And one of them is a doctor at Uganda Virus Research Institute, whom she purportedly said and wrote down in her paper here that she sent her Managed a tune of one hundred of one point eight billion shillings, and the doctor, as of today, has never seen the money, and has refused to be part of this report. I want to play this one, and many other doctors who are here. Summary of project budget allocations, and indeed, when you ask her the procedures she followed in channeling the 31 billion to different doctors, she cannot tell you the procedure she followed. She handpicked a few of them. Even those whom she handpicked, some of them have denied her. I lay on you the documents. Uh, thank you, right honorable speaker, and thank you, honorable Yona, for giving away. The clarification I want to get from you, this is money that has been appropriated by parliament. Now, to which organization has it been appropriated? Is it a government entity? Is it a private entity? Is it a particular person like I've been seeing with Atiyak? What kind of Recipient is this one you are referring to? Thank you, my dear colleague. That preside in its definition, it should be an outfit or a company. It's not registered anywhere and it is accessing big sums of money under the disguise of a group of scientists who have come together to produce for us a vaccine called Corona vaccine. That's how I can define it. But it is not a government entity. It's an initiative or just an outfit. She can give more definition of her organization. 
but she's we have appropriated it money we have given it 31 billion and as of we yeah. as we talk today honorable wilfred there was an issue of innovation science technology and innovation how much money had gone to individuals in the name of research and getting medicine for COVID. And the Honorable Yona came up and said, we have some kind of fictitious institutions that have benefited from this. And he said he had evidence to that effect. And that is the evidence we asked for. And that's what is laying on the table. So we'll ask the minister to come and make a statement, a comprehensive statement to that effect. On the monies that were received, how far she has gone with the creation of uh, COVID-XB, another medicine that treats COVID-X, I mean treats the COVID. Madam Speaker, as we talk today, the same preside uh, is now seeking more money, 50 billion supplementary budget. I want to lay it on the table here. Madam Speaker, preside is very strong that it can even be stronger than institutions of government. I have a paper, a letter here, headed preside, writing to the Minister of Finance, requesting to hold transfer and expenditure of funds for financial Yana, year 2021. Yana, preside is asking for a supplementary as what? A government entity or a private entity? Uh, if I can read everything here, supplementary expenditure for financial year 2021-2022. Uh, I see audit, they are writing to the Auditor General's office. My ministry, which is the Minister of Finance and Planning, has received an additional supplementary funding requests to finance recurrent and development activities under various institutions, financial year 2021-2022, as detailed below. In that demand, there is funding for vaccine manufacture and brackets preside 50 billion, 400 million. It's here, the letter is here. Please I can lay on it here. table, next. Yes, a chair, this is a chair of uh, innovation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am the chairman of the Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation. And my brother here, Yona Kanyomozi, Yona, Muzinguti. Yona is a member of that committee. And over the last few months, since the committee started its work, we have been engaging the Ministry of Science and Technology to see its direction after its, its vote was transferred to State House. A number of these questions are already before the committee. A week ago, I asked the minister to prepare a report, five reports. One of them is on preside. It's actually an abbreviation. It's a presidential scientific initiative on epidemics. It's just a, an initiative of the president, but put under means of science and technology. We also requested for a report on sericulture. We requested for a report on banana. We requested for a report on uh, Order, Madam Speaker. Research Institute. Order, All Madam I'm driving to is some of these documents are Order, before Speaker. the committee. And the report of preside is precisely Order, before Madam me. Speaker. Order, Madam Speaker. The information I'm giving Madam Speaker is that this piece of information. Order, Madam Speaker. Let him finish with his, his information. Maybe it is good for you. Yeah, uh, Chairman, you finish with the information. 
the information I mean, Madam Speaker, is that a comprehensive report has been presented to the committee on this particular matter. My prayer through you, Madam Speaker, to this house is that we be allowed to complete because it was, it was only until yesterday when we got the audited some of the information for the auditor general to complete the inquiry which the committee had already started on this matter so that we can effectively inform the country and this house what is going on about preside. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, you say, I have not been. You say this house did not have that information that the committee is looking at that aspect. And the issue that came up was on a presentation of uh, a minister. When she came and presented a, a paper last week. So for now, since the house has asked the minister to come and make a report here, let's get all the documents that help, that will help the minister. Because if we get the documents, that will help the minister defend herself on what on the allegations that Honorable Yona brought in this house. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your wise ruling. I thought I would benefit from my chair on giving me information, but he has only confused me. We have a WhatsApp group as the members of the science committee. I remember the deputy, your deputy was here. She sent the recordings of what transpired in parliament on when we tabled about our issue here. I remember you, Chairman, saying that you have requested reports from her and she has refused to give you reports that let them greet her. Now, how are you lying to us that she has given us a report? When did she give you a report? Did she give you a report alone? Come and give us this report. Show me that report, Mr. Chairman. So, so Honorable Yana, so could it, could it be that you're smuggling information from the committee? to the house? Because if you're smuggling information from the committee on something that you're looking at in the committee, are you looking at this, at this report in the house, I mean in the committee? Madam Speaker, the committee has never had any meeting to ask for a report about this. Neither has the committee ever wrote, read, wrote a report about this. This finding came to this parliament because of my prior knowledge I had in the Ministry of Science and because of the love and the zeal I have for science. I have no, and the zeal, the zeal I have for NRM because I well know in Agenda 2020, we well know that science is ready to take this country a step forward. That's why I'm here crying, Madam Speaker. Uh, and Madam Procedure. Speaker, I beg that I read these papers. Can you lay those papers mm. and I will refer that issue Thank to you. be looked at by the committee and report to Pro this house. Madam Speaker, I want to lay a paper where the minister, by then when she was a director of preside, when she was writing to the Minister of Finance to hold, request to hold transfer and, and expenditure of funds for financial 2020 and 2021 for Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, signed Dr. Musenero. In this letter, Madam Speaker, what was her interest? She's not yet a minister. She's not yet sworn in as a minister, but she's still writing to the Minister of Finance not fund the ministry. What was her intention? To serve Uganda? Lay the papers. I beg to lay it there, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, to make matters worse, I have a big report from the Attorney General querying preside itself. The Attorney General, Auditor General, on 8th of June, a special audit finding on COVID-19 related funding 
to the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation for the first three quarters of financial year 2020 to 2021. The, Attorney General, the Auditor General is asking about how did Preside begin? They did not do any feasibility study. And Madam Speaker, a project that does not have any feasibility study is doomed. That means they are going to do nothing, show the work. The Auditor General says- You lay on the table. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I beg today. Madam Speaker, I have a letter from this parliament. The Speaker of this parliament on 22nd September, writing to 22nd September, 2021, writing to the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Parliament Resolution on Reallocation of Funds from Vote 23, uh, Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation to Vote 001, Office of the President. Madam Speaker, I don't want to read the details, but this letter is talking about insubordination, contempt of Parliament, of the Minister, not adhering to a lawful resolution of this parliament, I beg today. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I want to lay on table this paper which talks about preside officials impersonating as government civil servants. And one of them, number four, is Dr. Masanza Michael, who is the husband of the minister. And we are allocating money to that preside. Madam Speaker, this is a serious conflict of interest. <laughs> Madam Speaker, another member is called Abel Winston Werekwa, who is a nephew. And we have allocated 35 billion, and the chairman is comfortable seated in his chair. Thank you for being a chair. I beg today. This information has come from the public, but I can read it for public consumption and parliament. There is a letter which I've just received, 15th March 2021. Uh, the PS of the ministry, the permanent secretary, O. O. Obong, writing to Dr. Musenero. By then, she was still a senior presidential advisor on epidemics. Writing to Dr. Musenero, a vet doctor, to give accountability of the 31 billion. If I am lying, why was the PS writing to her? I beg today. Madam Speaker, I have a memorandum of understanding between Preside and the serum company or in India called Samuri, which is a manufacturer of vaccine, the biggest manufacturer of vaccine in India, signing a memorandum with Preside. So, Madam Speaker, I beg to pray. Are we going to buy the vaccine from serum or we are going to innovate it under, under, under? I beg to read this paper, this memorandum of understanding, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as a scientist of this country, as I conclude, I want to assure this house and all members that research and development for a vaccine can only be developed 
in a biosafety lab level four. My former guild president is here, Kunarib, and the scientists were in the same class. It can only be manufactured in a biosafety lab level four. That level four in Africa is only in South Africa. In Makerere, in U Uganda Virus Research Institute, we have lab level two. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I don't want to underestimate the knowledge and information of our doctors, which they have acquired over time, because we know the best doctors in South Africa are Ugandan, some of them. But do we have the laboratories to do the work they are doing there here in Uganda? Madam Speaker, I have no intentions. Madam Speaker, as a former scientist, when I lost my position in parliament here, I presented my paper about post-harvest in America before Monsanto. I presented my paper before Bill Gates Foundation and I earned some money which government taxed me, taxpayers money, I brought money here. So as a scientist, <laughs> when I see masqueraders, a doctor of veterinary, masquerading that she can make a vaccine, we appropriate, she uses this parliament to give her money. And my comfortable chair, comes here to lie the parliament that we have been talking about this. Where is the report if you have talked about them? I would beg to move this house that this lady, the honorable minister, who was charged with the responsibility, the president is suffering a lot in, the, in his speech on the on his national address, the last national address, he said this parliament should Honorable help Yana, him. If you're done with it, if you're, if you're done with the, with the I summarize, Madam Speaker. He said in his speech, this parliament should help him to curb the corruption that we have in this, in this country. As a member of parliament from Tungam, I know when we are going to campaign, we as NRM, we suffer a lot. Why do we suffer? Honorable Yona, because, are you done with the lay? Madam Speaker, in conclusion, one minute. Why do we suffer? Are you, because, debating, are you debating on your papers? I'm still lay laying. Lay the madam. papers if you're done. There is, there is one last one, Madam Speaker. Mm. Yes. Mm. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, Corruption is a vampire that has sucked the blood of this nation and we sit and dine with the vampires. We should no longer call them mafias, but they are vampires and they should be arrested and brought to book. Madam Speaker, I keep this one for myself, but for my security, Madam Speaker, on Thursday, two vehicles followed me and I know you have enough security, I will not move out of this parliament before you give me one security. Thank you. Members, members, please. You know. Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I note with concern the issues 
my brother honorable yona msingu has raised madam speaker i would like at the same time acknowledge the contribution of scientists to this country and this economy madam speaker with this new development together with the submission from the chair of the committee i want to beg that if we are to have a meaningful debate in this house we be allowed first of all to examine and verify the documents which have been presented before the, before the house and also be given chance to fully sit down and respond oh, in this regard madam speaker madam I speaker like i want to ask, I want to thank you. Is it procedure matter? The Honorable Musa Sisi, when he became Prime Minister at the beginning of this sitting, and uh, Chief Government Chief Whip, although annoying, but he was doing the ordinary consuming information and pledging, I'm going to take it, the owners will come and answer. Now, he wants to answer. <laughs> Madam Speaker, there is no document that has been laid here that I choose as Honorable Musas. Even of a smaller thing like accompanying Musenero to go and pick money. These accusations are specific to preside and to someone now holding the portfolio of science. Madam Speaker, is Honorable Musasis, who became Prime Minister at the beginning of today's sitting, <laughs> and the Chief Government Chief Whip, you know, proceeding well to become the Minister for Science and Technology, to even pledge to parliament that he wants to go and check documents and then he comes back to answer. Yet last week, Madam Speaker, when the Honorable Iona raised this matter, we wanted to debate it, but you ruled that we allow the minister to come and present a statement today. That's why it is on the order paper. Is it a coincidence that this minister has run away and the Honorable Musa Sisi wants to claim that he is that minister we are talking about. And maybe his crime he, is that he has presented 50 billion for supplementary to this fake company. Is Honorable Musas Mus proceeding well to take over responsibility that is not his and then wanting parliament to stop demanding that the particular minister responsible for this mess comes here to explain that was your order, Madam Speaker, last week, that she comes here today. I thought Musa Sisi, Honorable, being wise, he will explain the whereabouts of this minister. Either she's in hospital or she has been arrested by police, and then Parliament will know. <laughs> Honorable members, Honorable Musa Sisi was just giving information and an apology of the minister that she will not be available to present her report today. She will be available on Thursday. However, with a new twist of things, we do not have all this information that we have. I am now referring, I am referring this. Motion. Can I? Motion, right on the Yes, speaker. Nathan. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, given the trend of things, I listened to Honorable Yona. Before he could make a statement, the chairman of, uh, of the committee of ICT jumped up. You recall he was the one of pensions before he became ICT, and we know what happened in the pensions. <laughs> so, uh, so, Madam Speaker, 
given that uh, this matter touches the people of Uganda, and uh, given the fact that the chairman of ICT is already uh, uh, not really, uh, and uh, given that we are dealing with a matter where there is an audit report, I think, wouldn't it be procedure right, Madam Speaker, that this matter be referred to PAC, PAC committee, it is given uh, three days. Yes, please, 50 billion income and expenditure. Yes, just looking at lines and accountability. Just even three days are too many. Referred to PACA committee so that by Thursday, uh, when we are the Madam Minister of Veterinary, is it she's a, the one who studied the veterinary? Before she comes and makes a report here, Parker Committee will have a, a report. Either she spent money rightly or wrongly, and to avoid the Budget Committee passing a supplementary of the 50 billion before we understand this. Wouldn't it be procedure right, Madam? Honorable Nathan, I have uh, had your submission. But I've also been seeing the chairman of PAC very interested in this thing. So I'm not sure whether it will be in safe hands. Uh, on that note, therefore, members, one, Minister of Internal Affairs, I want you to avail your now the security. Two, under Rule 190. I will have a select committee to handle this issue. And I will announce the members of the select committee tomorrow. Next item. Item number procedure, four. Procedure. 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 Right, Honorable Speaker. I hope we are not proceeding right. If, oh, sorry, I'm you're, sorry. You're, you're making a ruling to yourself. Uh, okay. Order, Thank you, order, right order, honorable speaker. Order, Madam Speaker. Order, order. Nathan, order. That's a maiden speech. Thank maiden you. Speech. Thank you, right honorable speaker. You have my letter. I ask for your protection. The same security that is taking Yona home. I kindly ask you, it takes me home. You have my issue. I came to your office. I thank you. Uh, members, members. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. Order, order, members. Right members. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Mbua, before you bring your issue. Members, honorable members, let's handle issues in the right place. If it is an issue of security, Minister of Internal Affairs, kind of avail members with your number, your contact, so that they are able to get, because the issue you have raised shouldn't come in this forum. It's, a, it's something that we are handling as parliament. It's not for the public. Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Mbwa. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, in 10th parliament, I happen to be on Committee of Science and Innovation. But Right Honorable Speaker, Anything that concerns presidential initiative on science and anything, it has a very big challenge. Right, Honorable Speaker, the procedure matter I'm bringing, if you just look at like presidential initiative on banana, which is in Bushen, it, it is in my district. But I cannot fail to say it has not benefited the community. Only an individual is benefiting, and that is taxpayers' money, right, Honorable Speaker. 
Right, Honorable Speaker, there is another presidential initiative on, on a certain drug, Birhazia, treating Birhazia, but when you go there, we visited nothing completely on the ground. So the Honor, procedure that I'm, I'm seeking, right, Honorable Speaker, with this select committee you've put in place, I have right, not, Honorable Speaker, I with have your not yet put in place. Okay, but uh, is it not would it be, uh, should it not be procedural, right, 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 Honorable Speaker, to include the so-called presidential initiative on innovation and uh, everything to make sure that we have a comprehensive report to save taxpayers' money. I'm doubting this chair even the face looks as if he has eaten uh, father father procedure father uh -huh. procedure right honorable no 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 honorable 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 members honorable members honorable members can I have the word eaten with the drone? Because you don't have evidence for that. Father. Thank you so much, right, Honorable Speaker. I presumed that maybe he's not fasting and he took lunch. I, will say, I sat with him in the canteen and I'm sure he's satisfied. I saw him, right, Honorable Speaker. Members. Honorable, honorable, there is, there is nothing you're saying. Members, on the terms of reference of the committee, that will be provided. Further procedure, procedure, right, honorable speaker, with your permission and indulgence. Right, honorable speaker, right, honorable speaker, a lot has been said about my sister, the honorable Musenero, Dr. Musenero, including matters that church integrity especially in her absence, to the extent that even her family has been mentioned, and I'm talking about the husband and nephew. And for purposes of giving a comprehensive framework where an honorable member of this house would equally be given an opportunity to defend herself, is it not procedurally right, therefore, that you permit the house to move a motion under rules 16, 57, and rule 190. Formally, as I humbly do, that you constitute, the House constitutes a select committee with comprehensive terms of reference, incorporating and encompassing whatever has been said about the Honorable Minister and tasking the said select committee of your choice in accordance with the rules to investigate the matter and bring a report in accordance with the rules of this House. I know, Right Honorable Speaker, that you had already made some undertaking on behalf of this House. May I pray that, however, that you be pleased to constitute on behalf of this parliament, that committee with detailed terms of reference, investigating, to investigate all those matters that have been raised against the honorable minister. And noting that the minister was given an opportunity to come and present to this August house and has failed to utilize that opportunity. I do not want to go to the extent of saying that she sent the Honorable Ms. Hassizi because some of the matters have risen on the floor. But this is a perfect opportunity for the Honorable Minister to defend herself, especially when we are faced with a request for supplementary, going to the same person when there are all these queries. I'm also alive to the fact that we have a committee responsible for this particular uh, ministry. However, with the confusion that you have seen on the floor displayed between the leadership and membership of the committee, I think the committee may find itself compromised in terms of 
providing uh, comprehensive results for this house. I beg to move. Members, is the motion more uh, seconded? Is, this, is the motion seconded? Members, now you're discussing the, 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 the merits of the matter. I put a question that those in favor that we, select, we have a select committee to investigate yes. the technology, science, and innovation. Those in favor say select aye. Select committee. And the contrary, uh, no. I. Members will give the select committee terms of reference. Item four. Procedure. The, the members who are talking about park, you'll, you'll learn the rules, what park is supposed to do. Look at the, the, the audit reports. Pro, procedure, Madam Speaker. Next item. Item four. Statement by the reader of the opposition on issues pertaining to half year releases for the financial year 2021 2022. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. This statement, and for information, I'm holding the fort for my superior, the leader of the opposition. The statement is being moved under Rule 53, Sub Rule 1 of our Rules of Procedure, and it pertains the half year releases for the financial year 2021-2022. As you are aware, execution of our national budget is controlled through quarterly releases. And this one is only concentrating focus. The analysis is only on quarter one and the quarter two. Quarter one from July to September, quarter two from October to December, Madam Speaker. And uh, I'm going to usher in my line minister, shadow minister of finance, the Honorable Mwanga Chivumbi, to read this statement on behalf of the leader of the opposition. All right, Honorable Speaker, we thank you for this opportunity. Honorable Chivumbi. Kindly give a summary, not sure. the yeah, presumption right. is that we've read it, it was uploaded. Yeah, right, Honorable Speaker, I will, I will try to kiss my presentation. I'll keep it short and simple. Right, Honorable Speaker, the spirit in which we come in should be understood. Ordinarily, this is not what we do as the opposition. Ordinarily, the, the execution of the budget is the exclusive mandate of the cabinet. And we normally go for, for accountability after that. But right honorable speaker, we've noted with concern that oversight functions of parliament should now be a little bit extended to monitor how money is released. Because once we don't monitor how money is released, then you cannot monitor implementation and execution of government programs. And this affects the overall performance. Right, Honorable Speaker, quarter one and quarter two releases have been released. And the categorization is of two. We've looked at recurrent and development. We've looked at agencies that have received the money and we have looked at agencies, even the best that have been here with the Ministry of Health and, and the intentions of government to see how they are followed up with the commitments, with the funding. Right Honorable Speaker, right Honorable Speaker, out of the approved budget uh, for the year 2021-22, mounting to 44.77 trillion, releases have so far been released for quarter one, which was 9.7 trillion and quarter to 11.9 trillion. This translates to, to 
0.6 trillion, which is 49% of the releases. Ordinarily, that is close to 50% after two quarters. And you would say, that's good enough. Table one, those of you who have the report, I'll speak to tables to be so quick, shows that of the, of the, of the budget we have, 29 trillion is recurrent expenditure. Development is 14, which mounts to 44. Half year release is as follows, right honorable members. Recurrent so far of the money of the 21 trillion that have been released is 17.7 trillion, which is 60% of the money that has been released. Development so far is only 4 trillion, which is 27%. That also can even, I can even stop there and tell the story. Now, we are going to look at the prioritization of these releases. Out of the money released so far, honorable colleagues, uh, we can see that recurrent is supposed to be 67%, development 14, I think I've spoken to that. When you look at the 17 trillion released honorable colleagues, or 21 trillion released so far, 17 is recurrent, which translates of the money released to 82% of the money that we have released in the two quarters have gone to recurrent expenditure. Development therefore has attracted only 18% and we are half year releases. Right honorable colleague, that means that of all the money in the district out there, in our constituencies, in our localities, most of it is for salaries and other things. There is no money whatsoever for doing development work in half year. I've also highlighted in table four, agencies on how agencies that have received big sums of money. In the last two quarters, the biggest agency to receive money of, of the 21, 9.8 has gone to treasure operations. Treasure operations so far means this is money that has gone to pay our debts. Honanandala, you were leader of opposition. You had your time, sir. The other money has gone to local government, which is two trillion. Ministry of Defense, because of security, has attracted the two trillion of the expenditure of the half year releases. Ministry of Finance and Planning, 442 trillion. Ministry of uh, Uganda Police Authority, 500. Uh, Uganda Police Force, 501 million. National Medical Stores, the one that buys drugs, 348 billion. Parliamentary Commission, 400 and, uh, 476 billion. Uganda Revenue Authority, 267 trillion. Ministry of Gender and Social Development, 177 million. Why we mention this, I want you to track down, that's why I seek the attention of Honorable Nandala, because it's uh, is a, a little interfering. The, 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 the reason why we are, we are tracking money that way is that on the second table, table five, we are trying to see categories of, uh, of monies. We have supplementary, which I will skip because that matter is before committee. If I speak to it now, it will, but there will be information to note here is that many agencies were suppressed and they are cut. I'll skip it because that detail we shall speak to it when we come to 
to the report of the budget committee that is considering. Now, on this table, yeah, on this table, I'll put down agencies that in last two quarters that have consumed more than 51%. One of it is the office of the president. It has consumed 100% in two quarters. So for all the money that was given to it, it has consumed it and exceeded. External security organization has also consumed 67%. State house, 62%. Uganda prisons has ex, is 57 56%. Uganda police force, 55%. Inspectorate of government, 53%. Ministry of Internal Affairs, 51%. Finance Intelligence Authority, 49 These are the big agencies in terms of receiving. Now, the point to note that none of these agencies is in the productive sector. Yet uh, the ones that have consumed a lot of money. Now we have votes, what I call trillion votes. Votes on our budget that attract trillions of shillings of money. We want to see on the releases, how are they performing? The first one is treasure operations, which out of our budget takes 15 trillion. It has done well, now in trillion, and it is a 65%. The next one is Ministry of Defense, which has a total of 3 trillion point eight. It has done well, it has consumed 2.0, which is 63%. The third trillion budget is the Ministry of Health, which is supposed to have 1.2 trillion. It has so far received in two quarters, 299 trillion equivalent to 25 percent minister of health minister of the national road authority UNRWA, that does our road has a budget of 3.3 trillion it has consumed 622 billion which is 19 percent so when you track the trillion agencies where you have trillions of money other than, other than treasure operations, which have stored you about for paying debt, and the Minister of Defense, the rest, even health, which was there, you are crossfire. It has not been given money, which is 22% only of the releases. So a lot of its money remains. Uh, uh, or, or now we have projects, right, Honorable Speaker, that are supposed, and this one I will read. We have delayed implementation of development projects. For the information of government, as earlier highlighted, development expenditure only constitutes 18% of the half year releases. It has been noted with concern that releases for development expenditure are usually done in quarter three and quarter four. It is at this moment that accounting officers commence procurement to comply with section 50, 15, subsection three of the Public Finance Management Act. By the time the procurements are concluded, the financial year is closing. This explains the, the decimal performance of development projects in the past financial years and will not, and will not be only different, and it will not be different this financial year. In the last financial year, 2021, out of the 68 core projects in the National Development Plan, only nine were on schedule. This translates to a performance of 13%. Such a performance cannot transform the country. It ultimately results in two low economic growth. However, such scenarios of delayed releases should not be existing anymore given the fact that the national budget for the next financial year is approved before the closure of the preceding financial year. Delayed implementation of government commitments, uh, fees, uh, you know, this is related, you know, because of time. 
Let me speak to it. Um, when you look at uh, right honorable speaker, it has been noted that there are accumulated dispersed funds mounting to 11 trillion, approximately 45%. This is money, right honorable speaker, that is not dispatched, mounting to 11 trillion. And out of this, we pay huge interest. Now, we pass a budget here strenuously, and the Minister of Finance don't release the money at the end of the year. We also have the issue of unspent balances. When money is released in the third quarter and the fourth quarter, agencies don't spend that money. It comes back to the Treasury Consolidated Fund. And in our budgeting system, there is no trace of unspent balance. We we'll never have an opening balance, nor do we ever see a closing balance. Therefore, it is important to note that much as agencies want money to be spent in the third quarter, the intention for the money not to be spent comes back to the center and it disappears in the thin air. Conclusion, right on, recommendation, right honorable speaker. The minister responsible for finance should immediately report to parliament the extent of unspent balances in the closed financial year. We want you to tell us how much money did, did you receive as unspent balance in the last financial year? The speaker is urged when exercising powers under section 24 of the Public Finance Management Act to appoint a member from the opposition. Right honorable speaker here, I've jumped a section on a classified because classified consumes a lot. Last year it was 15.5 trillion. This year has received a member. Right honorable speaker, in your powers, you, you, you appoint one person to the classified expenditure. Right honorable speaker, the law says it's the budget chair and the chair of the defense committee and one other member appointed by the speaker. What we are urging you, right honorable speaker, that this other one member should be a member of the opposition. Because when you have a member of the opposition, put him under oath, not to reveal secrets, state secrets forever, so that we have another eye outside the government that looks at classified expenditure. Otherwise, it is becoming hemorrhage. Maybe, maybe before you finish with your statement, the powers are vested on the speaker to appoint a member in that classified committee, as you've recommended. Just for your information, that was the first thing we did when we came to this parliament. Just as the name says classified, we appointed the members of opposition and they are classified. And that prayer should not even be there because it was done. Right on, Mr. Speaker, I thank you, but the committee is not classified. It's no, the we, we are appointed. It is, it is uh, the chairperson is automatically a member, and we appointed other members to be in that committee. So that was done. Honorable right Speaker, I thank you, and I don't intend to have a cross argument with the chair. It's not my argument in any way. I'll speak to my leader of the opposition on that issue. I think it should be in the no. The third, the third recommendation, honorable speaker, the minister responsible for finance should make regulations for classified expenditure as required under subsection um, 8.1, subsection 2G of the Public Finance Management Act. Why we are clamoring now to stimulate classified expenditure is to close that gap. When you have these regulations, all those things will be very clear. We are not imputing in any way, should not be understood, that classified expenditure is stolen. I mean, as, as a country, we, we, we know the needs of security, but uh, it can be stretched to another level. The other recommendation, right honorable speaker, section 78 of the Public Finance Management Act, the minister responsible for finance should make a report to parliament 
with an explanation on why government adjusted approved budgets beyond the permitted threshold and undertook subsidiary appropriation. This one, I preserve it, right, Honorable Speaker, because it will be discussed when we come with a supplementary report from the Committee of Budget. And I skip it number two. While releases are made beyond approved budget to office of the president, the minister will, will, will speak to it. Five, subsequent to parliament should review the budget cuts made by government. That's one also will come under the budget um, uh, when we report back. Lastly, parliament in the financial year 2022 should um, place a, a moratorium on votes with poor absorption of, of the budget. Right, Honorable Speaker, we have budgets that cronially don't absorb their budget. Yet we continue to heap them with a lot of money. So we want the Minister of Finance to come here and tell us the budget that have no absorption capacity. So that in the another year, we don't waste money that should have gone somewhere and you give it to those budgets. Right, Honorable Speaker, with those remarks attached is a copy of each vote. If members want to, to follow, you, must, you can follow and, and find out what is going on because you told me to summarize the statement, I beg to move. Thank you, Shadow Minister. And thank you for a good report, Finance. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I would like to thank Honorable Chivumbi for this analysis. However, Right Honorable Speaker, as, I, as he was presenting, I was looking forward to the gaps which Honorable Chivumbi was leading to, and I find that his report is largely information to the House and actually good information. What I can say is that we release uh, funds four times a year, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. And his observation is consistent we are now at 49% half year, and we are leading. We still have two quarters. I believe by end of financial year, we will be at 100 or close to 100%. On concerns about classified expenditure, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister, since the report that uh, the shadow has given us is in writing, wouldn't it be prudent for you to go and make a rebuttal? Madam Ideally, we are supposed to debate this report under Rule 532. But because you've realized there are gaps, there are no gaps. But also, even if there are no gaps, wouldn't it be prudent for you to go and bring a rebuttal in writing so that we debate all of it at once? Other than debating this one, then we debate what will come from you. Ma Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I beg your indulgence so that I state that I don't see why I should go back to prepare written information about this. Because all this information, Honorable Chivum has picked it from our records and it is a true record. I'm just wondering what am I going to write and bring to the House? I just take this as information to the House and I thank him for Fine. making this analysis. So it's open to a debate. Yes, Martin? Nathan? Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. 
thank you, Honorable Chivumbi, for a good report. And I also want to thank the Minister for accepting that this is true information. Right, Honorable Speaker, you find that uh, development expenditure, uh, according to leases, has a very small percentage. Right, Honorable Speaker, under development expenditure, we have agencies like UNRWA, agencies like Minister of Works, agencies like uh, Minister of Health. They subcontract. They they sub. Uh, they contracted contractors to do some work. Most of these contractors are crying, right on our speaker. Most of them have not been paid their money, right on our speaker. In a situation where everyone has been battling with with the pandemic, most of these contractors are in loans. Their money is being held up by government of Uganda. We are talking about economic stimulus from government aiding people to, vamp, uh, to, to revamp the economy. But in a situation where government is holding funds of contractors, right on the speaker, I don't find it fair. Comparing with other agencies which have already consumed 100% and we are in a second quarter, right on the speaker, I don't know how, what the minister will explain to us why some other agencies have already eaten 100% and yet other agencies which are also very important to our country has only received the peanuts. I thank you, right on us. Thank you, Martin. Another one minute, I hope you're taking note. Nathan? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, first and foremost, under Section 15 of the PFM, it is clear that Parliament is the one which approves the, the budget. And this budget is called the what you commit. And it will consist of uh, the procurement plans, the work plans, and the recruitment plans. And of course, the cash flow in the ministry is released according to that. Also, the cash flow is in respect of the money which you have collected. I would have been so happy, my brother Chivumbi, our minister of shadow minister, told us how much has been collected vis a vis how much has been spent. But having said that, under section 16, every three months, every accounting officer shall submit the sector treasury, the forecast of the of, of commitments and the cash position of the vote. And the sector treasury will use this for purposes of leases. Madam Speaker, one of the things which I was waiting for my brother Chivumbi to talk about that treasury operations are taking a huge amount of money to pay debts. And if we don't pay debts, we shall have a problem. Our thinking was that you would come up and say that we should reduce our appetite for borrowing. Because if we don't reduce appetite for borrowing, eventually all the collections we are going to collect will go for debt and we'll be left with nothing. And that's the reason why government is spending, I think, treasury, if we don't pay the 8.8 billion, will be declared bankrupt. And if we are declared bankrupt, then we shall never borrow anywhere. And the recurrent expenditure is basically for salaries, administration, and whatever. If you don't pay members of parliament here salary, I'm sure, Madam Speaker, you will not enter. And uh, if you don't enter, you will not care this house. So, Recurrent will be always a priority number one because it deals with day-to-day -day operations, which include salary and whatever. While the development, you can hold on to build a road, but you cannot hold on to pay salary of the workers. I was hoping that my colleague will say we rationalize salary. For example, 
An engineer in the Ministry of Works is paid about a million. But an engineer in the UNRWA, I think, picks about 30 million. Yet they were in the same engineering class, and the UNRWA is also a procurement entity just, and he's being paid more, and that's one of the causes of having the highest recurrent expenditures, which as a country, we should really think about. Madam Speaker, under the PFM, the Minister of Finance is supposed to submit quarterly reports. I don't know, when I was a chair of finance, I don't know what happens to people. He used to demand this quarterly reports. Now he's there, he's not producing. I need him to explain to us, why were you demanding at that time? Because you knew the purpose. And why are you not producing them? Is there anything which has gone, what has gone wrong? Madam Speaker, the purpose of the, the, the quarterly reports is to make a decision on how to move in the expenditures. I, the budget committee should have put the first question, why bring a supplementary when others have not what, got money? I am aware my brother Chivumbi is a member of the budget committee. He should not be bringing, he should be talking at that stage that before we pass this supplementary, where are we getting the money? Because you should not come and say, these are funded 19%, yet again, you are going to pass a supplementary to do further technical reallocations, cutting from the other ministries which are already disadvantaged. Madam Speaker, I think the budget committee should do us a, a service by looking at these expenditures before they bring the budget supplementary here. Because the moment they will bring it here, then there will be one of those who have committed a crime. Because you should have rejected it at that level that no, first of all, let us settle those ministries which have not what? Got money. The, the places which are suffering lost, most. It's local governments. Yes, local governments are suffering a lot. And also using this advantage also to mismanage the little they get. They say, we never got the money from the center. Then when you ask about the road, they say the road was washed by rain when the rain had not even rained. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, local governments are suffering where service delivery should be. And it would be very important today that the committee of budget comes with a better pro explanation to us what have they done about local governments. Madam Speaker, service delivery is really a question which we are raising every day. But when you go to the Water General's report, it is giving unqualified reports to local government. Oh, they did, uh, they have no problem. But when you ask about what happened, there's a problem. So also offices like Water General, Internal Water General, Procurement need to be reviewed seriously. Because you could be talking about the budgets. The dog who have sent might be not seeing what is being taken and partaking it. And the earlier we did that, the better. Madam Speaker, my colleague raised the issue of classified regulations. I want to state that the classified regulation exists. Maybe you need to give him a copy. And the chairman pack is a quorum. I'm sure you know it. So that one exists. And uh, he needs to get those. Finally, Madam Speaker, it, is, it, has, it looks to me that Parliament is just for purposes of coming to stamp a budget. What happens after? Nobody bothers. It would be important that before we deal with the supplemental or the other budgets, we must always review the performance of the previous budget, not vis-a-vis only money, but activities. Supposing I want to give Minister of Water, if we gave you money to make a thousand boreholes and we release the money, you must come and show us that you have done eight a thousand boreholes, or if you have not done, you have done less, you must explain. If you have done more, you must also explain. But every year, we're having incremental budgets.
-hmm. Madam Speaker, I'm going to conclude. This incremental budget is the point, in fact, where corruption is. Do you know that last year we got 100 billion? 20% were going to get 20 billion, 120. That means they have to plan. And they know that our budgets are basically incremental, not asking about the outputs in reality like activities. I would plead with colleagues who are on social committees, who are on budget committees, finance, that kindly review those, those activities. Okay, sir. Madam, I will allow you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm trying to understand what my brother is talking about. Because according to my understanding, we have a ministerial policy statement that is presented to Parliament. And in the ministerial policy statement, they must uh, detail what they have done in the past, the budget, and also the budget performance of what they were given. Then also projection of the plans that they have for the next financial year. That is how they, they do it. And they present it before uh, parliament and it is referred to the respective committees. And it's the committees to examine those reports, the output, the outturn, the money, the budget, and also they are supposed to do uh, value for money accountability. I don't know whether that is not good enough uh, 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 for my brother. Maybe you can also make other clarification. Uh, thank you very much. Madam Speaker, that is what should be, but also it should be, what is the total activities you want to do? Maybe, in, and you give even a period. For example, let me give you simplicity in a simple form. I don't know why you cry there's no water. Because you would say, we're going to make 5,000 boreholes in the country. These are over a period of five years. That means every year, 1,000. That means after five years, there should be no budget about boreholes. But we have boreholes every budget in and out. Where did the boreholes go? It looks these boreholes are never done. That's what I'm trying to say that it must be interrogated further. The easiest one, you know, I'm a coffee farmer. A point speaking. of information. When you're giving information, you don't switch on oh, uh, yeah, uh, the microphone. And, and you wait and for uh, Madam uh, Speaker, uh, I want to beg you. And the Honorable Nandala, everybody else wishes to speak. Yes, but I'm going to conclude. Madam Speaker, I, I want wish. to seek your indulgence. You need to cut out an induction course. The way I'm seeing things are happening, people just jump getting microphones anyhow. It's not that it kind of sense. And yes, you don't jump. And when you jump, you will say, I want to speak. They yeah, give you, then you switch on. Madam Speaker, the last one I wanted to speak about is about coffee. Coffee. If you count the number, the amount of money we put in coffee, even the tamaka roads would be carving coffee trees. So where did the coffee go? Those are issues you should raise. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Honorable members, uh, Nathan, the report is about half yearly releases vis-a-vis -vis the appropriation. How much was appropriated to that uh, sector and how much was released? Why was the released that amount? Why not what was appropriated? That is what the report is talking about. And of course, what you've said is very important that we need to look at our budget before we increase on the budgeting, in the, say, in appropriation. We need to look at the budget, why you think there should be an increment vis-a-vis -vis the action, what has been done in the previous year, and why are you increasing the budget? What is that that, that, that was not done? that you need to, to, to do. I think that's what is really raising. And of course, you're talking about the expenditure vis-a-vis -vis the, the income, what was collected, but the, the heading is very clear, the release. You know, he, he's a lawyer, he's not an accountant like you. 
Madam Speaker, you're right. They release, but you release what you have collected. You don't release it. So, so that, that, that's good information. I'm saying that's good information for the House. And maybe as what has been said, budget, you need to interest yourself on the local governments. Local governments are suffering. Yes. We need to have an we eye on it. Before we talk about anything, let's look at the local governments. And of course, the recurrent expenditure, as he has said, the moment you come to this house and it has not rained the way they call raining, then you will tell the Honorable Musa is not even to enter in the, in the what? In the gate, not even come near parliament. And um, you are aware under Rule 53, the statement should not take so long for a debate. Yes. You've gotten all the information. Can we have a response from, from the minister? Clarification. Right, Honorable Speaker. I think Honorable Nandala Mafab, with due respect, is an economist. He spoke for the sea and the forest at the same time. Some of his comments deserve some response. One, recurrent is supposed to drive development. It's like you having a vehicle, you buy a vehicle and you don't fuel it. The day-to-day -day operations of... Yes, so it's like paying members of parliament and there are no sessions to sit. You are paying them for what? So without corresponding performances on recurrent and development, you will never see service delivery. That's why we are saying, if you are going to release money for recurrent, release the equivalent money that is required for the recurrent expenditure to drive development. That's why we put for year percentage and said as a percentage form, as a percentage expenditure, recurrent they've spent 82%. Development, 18%. Therefore, such expenditure is screwed, cannot spur growth. Actually, you are just, I'm not saying it's wasteful. It's, it's a fun expenditure that is not in any book of economics and expected a land economics like Honorable Nandala but, to understand those things. But properly. actually, actually when you talk about the recurrent, that's where we have been having a complaint here. The, the issue of uh, oversight role. The current should be a hundred percent because we cannot you cannot do a number of things without having all the money there you cannot come and sit in the house when you're not paid so right honorable speaker that's the point i would like for this house to understand that honorable nandala mafabi submission looks to imagine that you see pay current and that is government should be there to pay salaries to pay this no Government, in essence, is supposed to drive development. And I shudder what government you will be in if you go for that kind of uh, expenditure. Members? Uh, Madam Speaker, the order I'm raising. Madam Speaker, there are some recurrent expenditures which have no corresponding development expenditure. For example, you are paying a debt of 9.8 trillion. So the, what development, because it looks you borrowed money, to do an development activity some time back, now the debt is due, you must pay. That one, if you go by that, then you will not pay a debt because you want to release equal money, equal to development. Madam Speaker, it's my brother. You borrowed the money for a capital expenditure. It has been done. So what you have to do- And now that? when you're paying, it becomes your recurrent. Exactly. Yes. So what I'm trying to put up, Madam Speaker, is that the 9.8 billion, is corresponding to development over the other time. If we assume we put it at proper use. So if it was put at wrong use, it's now where you would be getting up. That we were paying 9.8 billion wrongly. So Madam Speaker, what I'm putting across is that there is no way you will not pay me salary because you, are not, you have closed the parliament. Unless you are saying my contract has ended. But if it has not ended, there are fixed contracts. Whether anyway. there's work or no work, you must pay. Members, we've gotten an alternative report from opposition, and it's a very good report. I really appreciate the uh, opposition is putting us to alert that much as you do ABCD, this is what you should consider. We appreciate that. And um, we are not in an accounting class. 
Can we have a response from the minister? Uh, and maybe just for a clarification to Honorable Chivombi, we have the classified for accountability committees, but we also have the classified for budget. I was on the floor. No. And the budgeting stage. Yeah, right, Honorable Speaker. I know what I'm talking about. Actually, the chair park by, by law is supposed to be part of the accountability committee for classified. That much I know. But classified as an expend, as an expenditure part of the arm. We have it. Yes, we the law says. You have a chair budget, chair defense, and one other person appointed by the speaker to ensure for uh, accountability. That other person appointed by speaker is not classified. He has to be public, answerable to, 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 to the public of Uganda. He can't, that person can't be classified. It's not in any regulation, but I chose not to oppose it. But I strongly think that that person should be announced here. We know that person. So if things is go it, wrong- Is it in the law that we, we should announce it here? Yes. Every, um, every appointment of the speaker is announced here. No, I am saying that person of the classified. Chair, the, I know the, the last person to uh, Colonel Fred Mercy, but it was announced here. Uh, Honorable Minister was on, on the floor. Procedure. Members, when we announce the members of the committee, you know the problem, Honorable Chivombi, we even gave a copy to your office, opposition office. We came and announced in the house that we have classified. And I remember I chaired, it was under the tent. Maybe because the tent was too big that you could not hear what was being said, but we will give you a copy of the your position people that were given. Uh, Minister, but I thought you had delegated Madam your Speaker, member to speak. No, I, no, I was citing the dictates of uh, the public finance and the management. I am saying the minister on, is still on the floor. It was, it was a procedure. But the minister, before he comes, he uh, uh, was claiming there were no gaps. No. But I would want him to commit no. himself. No. Please, first sit, let him first respond. Thank you, right honorable speaker. Right honorable speaker, I would like to appreciate honorable Mafavi, my senior in the profession and my senior in the house for the analysis he has made. Right Honorable Speaker, why I appreciate him is that in 2015, when we enacted the Public Finance Management Act, we gave it comprehensive provisions in as far as management of public finances is concerned. And one point, good point he has raised, is on the cash flows. We release money based on the collections and we normally do cash flow projections. Not, not actually projections, realities, we call them cash limits. I want to say that whereas it is our desire release all the money we budget. When the revenue performance is not good, we release what we have. And this is what Honorable Mafavi stated. But this also, the point he touched me on was the point on reporting to Parliament. Honorable Mafavi, you know very well that the Section 18 of the Public Finance Management Act requires the minister to report twice to parliament in a, uh, to report twice to parliament in as far as managing public expenditure is concerned 
I want to inform this House that on a quarterly basis, we release funds after scrutinizing the cash flow plans, the procurement plans, and other relevant documents, which the law requires us to look at. Madam Speaker, um, on the issue, I do acknowledge where Honorable Chivumbi is coming from, being a, a lawyer of some sort. According to what the speaker said, she said, I, I did not say that. And it I, was not for you to repeat it. Then I, I withdraw if that is the case. But in this case, Chivumbi, no, Honorable Chivumbi, not being an accountant, he wants to compare. He wants to compare. Really, uh, 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 he wants to compare recurrent with the development in the same movement. That when you 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 re, you make a release on recurrent, it must correspond with some release on development, which is not always the case. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And I also want to inform him and the House that there are some activities of development in nature which exist under recurrent expenditure, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, going forward, I want to say that Uganda has the best budgeting system in the whole of Africa. This one we pick it from the forums we go to. It is very transparent. Whatever we do in the budget is known to all the stakeholders, including Parliament. And therefore, Madam Speaker, as I conclude, we shall always release funds as Minister of Finance timely, and that is when the quarter end begins. From first to 10, we shall have released the money, and we shall release the funds, which we shall have collected from the taxes and the other sources we, we use to finance the budget. And we commit that we shall always report our performance. I, I get clarification from Honorable Asha. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for giving way. Uh, Honorable Minister, I would love to know from you if, if Ministry for Presidency has spent 102 by end of half year without even coming back to parliament. Number one, it's 102%. And two percent. They have spent 102%. Number one, where have they gotten the 2% before coming back? Number two, when will ever the Ministry for Presidency learn to budget? Because there's no single year they have gone away without coming for supplementaries. Uh, thank you so much, my friend, Honorable Aisha, for the for raising the point of clarification. How the 102% arises is that this vote received a supplementary. And also this report is, not co is looking at, is comparing the release to date vis-a-vis -vis what you have spent. So the votes, therefore, there are a number of votes which received COVID supplementary you are likely to see them performing above 100% so far. But as we get close to the financial year, to the end of financial year, you might find that they will get lesser releases in the third or fourth quarter, and when we get to Bara, it will come to more, sorry? Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for giving me. Why did they spend more than one or two percent before coming here? In the same law, whether we need to show it now, we have allowed the ministry, the government, to spend three percent before coming to Parliament. And that's where, again, we have an issue which we must deal with at the Parliament. These three percent, we have not put guidelines on where to spend. So they can spend it in anywhere. 
and come that this will this just you don't you just get retrospective authority but it is uh, you see, you gave the three percent as this parliament. You did not give the guidelines, and uh, the two percent could be from the three percent. So you gave them powers, unlimited powers. Uh, thank you, Nayo Mafabi, for the information. Actually you enhanced one of Aisha's question that what, were, what was the source of the over expenditure? Madam Speaker, the law provides that uh, government has a window to spend 3% of the previous budget and report to parliament within four months. And this is uh, section 25 of the Public Finance Management Act 2015. And excess, any excess beyond the 3%, we must first seek parliamentary approval. Madam Speaker, there are rules, the same rules that govern supplementary spending applies to even the 3% before we come here. And this, uh, it must be an item of unforeseen and it must be an item of unavoidable if it is to qualify to be financed <coughs> under this rule. Madam Chair, like I was concluding earlier, I want to say that we are committed to... Uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, budgeting is a costed work plan, and the work plan must be done in accordance with the timelines. You cannot plan to do everything in one day. In the course of the year, you have planned activities on different months consequent, uh, accordingly, and you plan and cost. Uh, those activities best uh, uh, in those months. Therefore, I find it difficult to say that in half a year, you have spent 17 billion on recurrent, when in actual sense, you should have spent 14.5, uh, uh, because the total cost uh, recurrent for the whole year was 29 trillion, but you have spent 82% instead of having spent half. That means that you are spending on what you never planned to be done in this same time. You are bringing nearer what you had planned to spend in the other months, now you're planning down. And how could it be possible? Because my thinking is that your activities, the activities are done today, another one tomorrow, until you finish your, 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 your year. Thank you. Madam Speaker. There is, there is another person behind you. Another clarification? Yes. yes. I'm likely to lose this point. Pardon? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the record, I'm Kambale Ferigo, MP representing Kassas Municipality. I want to clarify on what the colleague has just presented. According to the report, when he talks about 82%, having been allocated to recurrent expenditure. It doesn't mean it's the 82% of the overall budget. It is 82% of the release for the two quarters so half, far. Half, half year. What is 21 that has been released for half year? Out of which 17 trillion, which constitutes 82%. We are talking about 82% of what has been released so far. As opposed to their hundred percent, exactly. which was supposed to be released. So it doesn't mean they have already gone eighty-two percent of the overall budget now, of now the year. Now the, the difference so, would come in in the budget cuts that have been there. That instead of releasing a hundred percent, you've released eighty or eighty-two percent. I wanted to make to that. 100%. I wanted to, the, to make that clarification to the colleague. You know, you know now this. 
aspect can only be talked by people who know figures. So, Honorable Minister, can you give last clarification, Honorable? Yes, Lillian. Thank you very much, uh, Right Honorable Speaker. Before the Minister concludes, I would like to seek clarity over the functionality of these newly created function, uh, administrative units. Right Honorable Speaker, as you are aware, it has been a norm that we create new sub-counties and town councils. But these administrative units have been grippling. They are not functioning. The Honorable Minister here made mention about the immediate release and timely release of funds. I would like to know from the right honor, from the from the honorable minister when we are going to have these small administrative units begin uh, functioning and they will be funded. I thank you. Members, I want you to be mindful of uh, the loaded. Yes, Medi. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, the Honorable Nandala Mafabi raised an important issue that has been uh, preoccupied by, by the Honorable yeah. Abel. The issue of revenue and expenditure, you've well and ably explained. And the Honorable Chivumbi put the facts clearly to you, and you considered on that matter. However, the most important thing at the moment and what members keep being, the questions that members are meeting in their constituencies is the performance at local government level. Their accounts being centrally controlled. The fact that people raise revenue and the revenue is taken to the center and they don't know what time the remittances are done and in what, you know, and for performance of what? Councillors and district councils formulate their budgets, present them, and before you know, they are useless. So we are not respecting the principle of decentralization. That is where you see that our budget performance is still poor. Yes, on paper, we have amazing paperwork. Like you said, in Africa, our budgetary principles are the best. But now we are killing the same baby based on deep centralization on implementation. That is why the Honorable Nandala Mafavi told you that you reach local governments and districts, and people tell you they worked on roads and culverts, and rightly so, they have worked on nothing. But they are there being paid wages and salaries for zero performance. So you incur costs with zero output. That is what this August House wants to know that as we are giving you money, what is the value for the money you keep asking for, value for money? Uh, and and uh, Honorable Minister, one thing you need to know that the NTR that is collected from these local governments has a deadline as when it should be submitted to, to the consolidated fund account. But it, it does not have a deadline when you should return it back to the, I mean, to local government, these local governments are suffering, as members are saying. They cannot even collect garbage. You find cities smelling, they cannot collect garbage because they are not able to get the releases. The release that you send from, from finance reaches the, the local government so late that you can't even do anything. So you need to address those matters, even when you're doing the budgeting. This report is just not, the report is not just for fun. It is, it is raising issues, eh? <coughs> Members? Ma Madam Speaker, yes, I just want Thank you. To... Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the issue raised by Honorable Kivumbi is closely linked to the matter that has been before this house about how the Ministry of Finance tampers with budget, and then they don't come back to this house. The Honorable Minister knows that once we approve a budget, we don't approve the budget as figures only. We approve with the work plan, including the disbursement plan. So if you tamper with the disbursement and you don't release money as it was scheduled, it is only proper that you come back to this house and work with the agencies. The agencies revises their work plan, but also revises the disbursement plan 
so that you can then release the money according to the new schedule. And that's the point I wanted the minister to speak to, whether he's going to come back to this house and lay the new work plans for the various ministries, departments, and agencies with their disbursement plans. Thank you. Right of speaker, uh, I just wanted to make a comment on the, uh, the argument that the local governments are suffering and there's no money. Uh, the county moved and adopted decentralization and it set categories of activities that are supposed to be performed by local governments and those which are centralized. But the challenge now is roads that are supposed to be under the districts and even under the sub-counties have been worked upon by the ministries. You find the Minister of Agriculture, you find it in local governments constructing roads, you find Minister of Works and Transport constructing roads, even primary classrooms that are supposed to be constructed by local governments have been managed by central government. The idea was that local governments are supposed to do these activities themselves under the supervision of the ministries. But this time you find it is the ministries. Sometimes they say these are projects being financed by World Bank, but still they are decentralized projects. But now, in some cases, they will say, no, we have given this to the local governments. They are supposed to get contractors. But what actually happens on ground is that they are in phase. They say local governments can contract, but do the contract. I mean, pick the contractors among the following. And just let me build on my point. I will give you information. So, right of the speaker, they will say the local governments will pick out of these six. Normally, they reinforce the contractors. But most of these contractors are contractors related to people. When they are performing the activities on the ground, they don't pay attention. Chair, to, Chair, please. local government, yes. why don't you give this house a report to that effect? Because that is your docket. I was but, just saying, uh, I was just submitting no, that, but we're coming up with a report. I, I think it's not, uh, you need to give us a comprehensive report. Right, I will speak, we're going to give that. I was just giving information. Madam oh, speaker. Okay. Madam Minister, speaker. can we have... Madam Speaker. Madam, Madam Speaker. Is it on local government? Yes, it is on local government. Madam Speaker, you know this issue of, uh, of sending collection from districts or from local governments sending first centrally is something which I think has worked for about two or three years. It's a new thing that is centralizing the collection, the local collection to the center and taking from the center back to the local governments for them to be able to do their work is a big challenge. It's a very, very big challenge. I think it is important that you review that so that this collection should not come to the center again. You make it very difficult for local governments let, to operate. Let the, let the committee of local government and uh, central, I mean, uh, and the uh, Mapendusis committee is what? Park local government and then the committee of local government come up with a comprehensive report for 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 government to be able to to see what to do. If it means reversing that decision, it should be based on a documentary evidence. Uh, Minister, can you give us your final local government? You're going to handle the thing, not so. Um, thank you, right thank you. I just I just wanted to offer some clarification. Right Honorable, about a month or two, there was a motion moved by the Shadow Minister for Local Government, urging government to reverse the decision to have locally collected revenue sent to the Consolidated Fund. And this parliament passes uh, you know, a resolution supporting that motion. It would be fair for the Honorable Minister to tell us how far they have gone. It's important, uh, Right Honorable, a speaker, that the decision of this parliament is respected. So it would be good for the Honorable Minister to tell us how far they have gone with that. Second, the right Honorable uh, uh, Speaker, 
every financial year, at the end of the financial year, of course, we know the financial year ends on 30th of June. The local government entities are required to have monies that will have not, uh, you will come in later, will have not been utilized to have it sent to the treasury. Right honorable speaker, I would like to know from the honorable minister, because we know the financial year ends on 30th of June, but every year by 20th or even by 15th of June, they are already disorganizing local government, switching off the system, harassing local government, and local government fail to perform. And then they collect a lot of money and send it back to the treasury. That is not fair. And therefore the honorable minister needs to clarify. Thank you. Members, we have a team from NAPAC up there. We have the, I want to recognize the members in the public gallery. Uh, we have Mr. Were Asha from uh, the Workers' Union. We have Mr. Kecho John, Mr. Kelo Mosa, Mr. Mauk Moses, Mr. Abima Steven, Mr. Babaz Joseph, Mr. Baleka Moses, you're almost welcome. Honorable Minister, can we conclude with this debate? Uh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Speaker. I'd like to conclude by responding to the following issues raised by members. Honorable Lily Annabelle is concerned about when we shall release money. We shall avail money to the new administrative units. Madam Speaker, I wish to inform the House that in the supplemental schedule one, which is under consideration by the Budget Committee, we have provided 29.2 billion to cater for the new administrative units. Um, but uh, there is uh, a concern on how much money we send to local governments vis-a-vis -vis what we spend at the center. Before I respond to this, I'd like to inform the House, right honorable speaker, that under local governments, all their budget is being released 100%. And the budgets under local government are both recurrent and development. The only challenge which is there, which we are resolving, is this new development of requiring the engineering brigade of the UPDF to do contracts under the World Bank projects, and uh, we are still involved in negotiations with, with the World Bank to see how best we can actualize this new directive. That has caused some delays, but I want to say that whereas the local governments may want to access all the money to do activities, also from the center, the direct interventions have caused significant impact in the local governments where most of us come from. Why releases rich rate? Madam Speaker, as I stated earlier, we release money by 10th of the month. And after we have released, there is another step to take. First of all, there is a warrant and the requirements that you must, you must provide a report for the previous quarter, et cetera, et cetera. Most of these local governments, the cows take long to bring these reports and that's why their money sometimes take uh, more than two or sometimes a month to reach on their account. Honorable Odur is asking whether we are going to make another work plan? The answer is no. 
we implement the budget in accordance with the Public Finance Management Act. And whatever we are doing, like Honorable Mafavi stated earlier, is consistent with the provisions of the Public Finance Management Act. Madam Speaker, I beg to submit. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Position you've had it. And, uh... Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, why I wanted to raise a procedural matter is because of the Public Finance Management Act Section 24, subsection 2. When you constitute that committee, uh, it is for the consumption, the membership of it is for the consumption of the House. What ought to be convened or done in a closed session are those meetings that scrutinize the classified expenditure, but not the membership. Secondly, I expected the Honorable Minister to give credit where it is due. This uh, statement, this uh, statement. Just, just a minute. You read what is on 24 to a committee of parliament comprising of a chairperson of the committee responsible for the budget. The chairperson of the committee responsible for defense and internal affairs. And another member appointed by the speaker shall scrutinize the classified expenditure budget in a closed session. Yeah, the, the, the scrutiny. I thought, I thought there was a continuation that uh, the names will be brought to the house. Anyway, you continue. But okay. what I can tell you is uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the minister was uh, merely dismissing this statement <laughs> as a mere piece of information. Honorable Minister, you have not been fair to yourself. Because if the development expenditure constitutes 18%, of the releases of half the year of the releases. Doesn't it uh, worry you? Doesn't it raise uh, grave concerns of how, in fact, this should be a wake up call to you as a ministry to fast track, to lay strategies of how to fast track the absorption of these funds. Because most of these funds that are meant for development uh, budget are mobilized through loans. And most of these loans, we even as House of Parliament, Madam Speaker, we don't know the performance of most of these loans. What we end up with is lack of absorption. There is very poor absorption of funds. Most of these funds that are meant for development but, expenditure. But, but Honorable Nambeshe, how do you absorb what you don't have? Madam Speaker, I suppose that's, that's why these funds have been allocated. Uh, this fund is have been allocated. I was saying, look at what you have collected. How much have you collected? You've been having a problem, COVID, COVID, and there is, the, the economy is not doing well. It's not that the money is not absorbed. The money is not there. Why don't you learn to speak the truth for your country? In fact, right, Honorable Speaker, you have even aided me to remember how, and I would like the minister to explain how uh, unsp how unspent balances are incorporated in the new budget. That is a gap. And now you go mute. And that you should explain to this house. How are these unspent balances incorporated? That is one. Question two, Madam Speaker, which uh, I'm concluding anyway. Let him finish. Is that he talked about gaps. And he knows very well that the law mandates the ministry to make regulations. But up to now, the minister has failed completely to commit himself to make regulations for classified expenditure. And I would like him to make that commitment in this house. Why has he failed up to now to Honorable. make regulations for classified expenditure, Madam Speaker? Honorable clarification, minister. clarification. Honorable Minister. Clarification to also the Honorable Minister. Honorable Honorable minister can you conclude? Madam Speaker, Madam can you, speak. do you have a regulation for classified expenditure? Mad Madam Speaker, I want to 
That's why I was seeking clarification. Because sometimes in these matters, irrespective of which side you are, we must all benefit. Madam Speaker, we have the Public Finance Management Act 2015 as amended, which I got opportunity. I got an opportunity to extensively participate in its enactment together with my father and others. Subsequent to the law, we made regulations. This law has each, each, each section in this law has got a corresponding regulation that operationalizes the section. In this regard, I would like to refer him to section 24, if Honorable uh, Chivumbi can confirm, on classified expenditure. When you pick a copy of our regulations, you will find a regulation that operationalizes this. So I'm just wondering, which other, in which further information the Honorable colleague would like this? Uh, Honorable, like can, can the minister finish? And, uh, what is telling you that uh, in the regulations of 20... Yes, in other words, the, the regulations an are enabling law. The regulations are comprehensive enough to cover all aspects of public finance management in this country. Madam Chair, Speaker, the last point, I thought I had finished, but Honor Nambeshe brought me back. The last point I would like to clarify from his submission is that we need to differentiate between absorption and disbursement. You cannot absorb what you don't have. If we have not released the funds, the issue of absorption, of raw absorption, cannot arise. You cannot spend what has not been disbursed to you. When we get a loan, when we approve a loan as a house, that is one stage. There is an, another stage where the, the, where the funders have got to disburse money, and then subsequently this money finds its way into our financial and budgeting system. So these two must be clearly uh, interpreted if we are to squarely debate these matters of the budget, Madam. Madam. The unspent balances, on the unspent balances, Madam Chair, the law also provides that appropriation will expire at the end of the financial year, 30th June. And the opening financial year starts on 1st June. 1st July. 1st July. Our budgeting system, Madam Speaker, does not provide for carry forwards. We start afresh every financial year. Nathan. Yeah, Madam Speaker, thank yeah. you so much. Madam, Madam Speaker, Speaker, I want uh, to give, uh, I want to help the minister. Madam Speaker, under section 17, that is the expire of appropriation. It says that every appropriation by parliament shall expire and cease to have any effect in the close of the financial year for which is made. A vote which does not expend, listen, a vote which does not expend money that was appropriated a vote for the financial year shall, yeah, shall at the close of the financial year repay the money to the that consolidated the fund. Consolidated that means your fund, you take it. Then it says, a vote that repays money under, sex, under, sex, under subsection two shall revise, shall revise its work plan, in annual work plan, procurement plan, and recruitment plan to take into account the, unexpend, the unexpended money and the minister responsible for the vote shall submit as part of the budget for the proceeding year. The revised work plan, procurement plan to the minister. You see what it's meaning? That every vote which has repaid money in the consolidated fund should adjust its work plans to take care of that. Because if you are constructing a building and you have not finished, the money came at the financial year, you have not paid the certificate outstanding. Nothing that is understood. You have helped the minister. 
So I, so I should pay me now. Yes. So Madam Speaker, uh, I wanted to make one comment just before the minister comes. Madam Speaker, you are aware the regulations are there. I want us to put the hands. How do you appoint Chairman Park to be the, the chair of classified? It's under the regulation. So which regulation did we use? Because there. Yeah. So Madam Speaker, if there are problems with regulations, maybe you need them to be amended or whatever, members should raise that. But the regulation to operationalize the Public Finance Management Act 2015 are there. Mr. Minister, it is not an amendment. We removed the Public Finance and Accountability Act. We removed, then we brought the Public Finance Management Act. Madam Speaker, conclusion, this law is the best, and many countries have copied it, and one thank the member who made it. But Minister of Finance is diluting it. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank Honorable Chivumbi for igniting this debate. This is, this is uh, a debate I enjoy most as a member of parliament for Rwanda County East. And I want to thank Honorable Nanda Ramafavi for helping me. I'm making a speech, please. Um, I want to thank- You know, when you start giggling that it has not been answered. If you don't know accounting, you don't know. <laughs> if you're a historian, you're a historian. I want to what, what we are discussing now here, the report, the report of Honorable Chivumbi is not a report for any ordinary person. It is a report of substance that you're talking about the budgeting process. You're talking about the expenditure, the income of the country, how it is spent. Let's not just giggle around that it is not answered. It is not something just. Madam Speaker, lastly, I want to thank Honorable Mafavi for really enhancing my submission today. And I want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to go into the in-depth of this debate. Colleagues, let's uh, work together to improve financial management in this country by respecting the good role we made in 2015. Thank you. Honorable Chivumbi, I want to thank you so much for being a watchdog, for putting the checks and balances. You're doing a good job by this report. You're making the, this side to wake up that we are watching you. You must do the right thing at the right time. Thank you so much for the report. And uh, we do appreciate. And you need always to come with an alternative uh, policy for whatever is being done on the other side to help Ugandans. Next item. Item five, presentation of a petition on the unsatisfactory and unfair service delivery by various telecommunication service providers in Uganda. Honorable Ambassador. Just give us a summary of, of your petition. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I'm moving under Rule 30 of the Rules of Procedure of the Parliament of Uganda. The humble petition of the subscribers of all telecommunication companies doing business in Uganda, including MTN Uganda, Airtel Uganda, Star DT, trading as Star Times Uganda, Tangerine, trading as Leica Mobile, Smile Communications Uganda Limited, Rock Telecom, and Huawei Technology. I'm Haji Kaziwe Bashir Mbazir, a member of parliament on behalf of the people of Kawempe South. And uh, this petition, right, Honorable Speaker, showeth and states as follows. Your humble petitioners, inclusive of Hassan Mbuga, Alan Paul Musoke, Hanifa Nakalisa, Philip Mwesigwa, and Juma Lubega, are Ugandan users and consumers of the services of the various telecommunication companies. These services include and are not limited to the following, making phone calls, data and online communication, mobile uh, data and online communication, mobile money transfer transactions, short message services, that is SMS, as well as watching digital terrestrial television channels. 
Right Honorable Speaker and members, despite continued pleas and public outcry from the general public to the service providers, there is an increased poor delivery of these services by the operators, and this comes at the cost and expense of the end user. Poor network by these providers has increasingly made it costly to your petitioners, right honorable speaker, to make telephone calls. And to us in matters, dropped calls increase on this very burden. When a call is made, for example, and, is, and is, it is dropped due to poor networks, this is of course on the side of the service provider, the operator charges the user for the entire minute even when less has been used. Procedure matter. Madam Speaker, under our rules of procedure, rule 30, sub rule four that the member is proceeding, he must confine himself to the parties to the petition and the signatures of the people alleging the material facts therein. He's not supposed to proceed and give the details here. So are we proceeding right when we allow him to present the details of the petition when the rules prohibit that? Actually, the petition was uh, delivered to the speaker's office uh, by the petitioners themselves, and the signatures are there. The member was only requested to come and present because the speaker cannot present the report. So he's, he's proceeding well, and uh, uh, we've had the matter that is being raised by 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 the member who will refer that that petition to the committee of ICT and ICT will report back in 45 days. Next item. Item. Uh, can I, members allow me to write the order paper and we look at the issue of NAPAC because the NAPAC team wants to go back to Karamoja. Right, Honorable Speaker. Proceed, Your right, Honorable Speaker. I did not make prayers for this very petition. Is it proceeded right for us to end like that, right, Honorable? I presented a petition, but I didn't make prayers for the same. You lay the petition on the table. Okay. Make the prayers and lay it on the table. Uh, now, therefore, your petition is right, Honorable Speaker. In view of the above matters as laid on table in the petition, we are praying that Parliament investigates the quality of the services provided by the telecommunication companies to enable the subscribers to realize the value for their money. Right, Honorable Speaker, not even a single coin of a Ugandan user of these telecom services should be lost and exploited by the companies. We beg to move. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Of ICT to report in 45 days. Lay it. Lay. Lay on table. Yeah, I do lay it on table. What is the title? Is the petition to the Parliament of Uganda expressing the unsatisfied unsatisfaction of the service providers, especially the telecommunication companies in Uganda. Thank you. Yeah. Item Hello. nine, motion Hello. for a resolution of parliament urging government to respond to the plight of Karamojong children enslaved in street begging and child labor. Right, Honorable Speaker, I am Nakut Faith, the district woman representative for NAPAC. I stand here to move a motion for a resolution of parliament urging government to respond to the plight of Karmajong children enslaved in street begging and child labor. Moved under rule 56 of our rules of procedure. Whereas article 34 of the constitution of the Republic of Uganda in 1995 recognizes the rights of children 
that include protection of children from social or economic exploitation, unemployment likely to be hazardous or to interfere with their education or social development. And whereas the Trafficking in Persons Act 2009 expressly prohibits trafficking in children and the Children's Act of 1996 and the Employment Act of 2006 prohibits employment of children below 12, except in such light work as the minister may prescribe and employment of children below 14 years in hazardous labor conditions. Aware that Uganda ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which obliges member states to ensure that in all actions concerning children, the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration and that the state should ensure to the maximum extent possible, the survival and development of the child. Also the International Law Labor, the International Labor Organization Convention number 182 and 183 on elimination of worst forms of child labor and minimum age of employment respectively, which aim to protect children from the worst forms of child labor. Cognizant of the fact that Uganda and indeed this parliament have committed themselves to the full implementation of the sustainable development goals, including ending abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against children. Further cognizant of the fact that government has made interventions to address the plight of street children, including development of a multi-sectoral street children strategy with a focus on Karamoja, which emphasizes the withdrawal of children and their families from the streets, their integration, empowerment with livelihood skills, and strengthening child protection mechanisms, as well as the establishment of a coordination office for trafficking in persons under the Ministry of Internal Affairs with the National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons. Concerned that, despite the interventions by government and other actors, the number of Karmajong children on streets in urban centers has increased with approximately 686 out of 739 children from Napak district alone reported at the destination point in Kampala in 2020. A Women Empowerment and Opportunity Desk of Moroto Diocese survey indicates that a total of 871 children left their homes in specific areas in the park district, of which 561 were girls compared to 310 boys. Further concerned that these children are exposed to various forms of abuse and exploitation, including forced labor, slavery, street begging, street hawking, commercial sexual exploitation, and physical assaults, assaults, and poor living conditions for those that are lucky to find accommodation. Moreover, in a bid to clean up the city, law enforcement agencies round up children on the street and wrongly charge them. Noting that these children find themselves on the streets and other exploitative conditions due to various circumstances that still persist. For example, poverty, food insecurity, lack of economic opportunities, trafficking, demand for labor, lack of family support, maltreatment, domestic violence, sexual abuse, orphanhood, and obligations on children to contribute to the family livelihood. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this parliament that one, government strengthens collaboration with local authorities in Karamoja region and urban centers to ensure that there are coordinated efforts in rescuing the children following proper procedure. Number two, government addresses push factors as many of the children are victims of trafficking and other forms of violence. Number three, that government revises the street children strategy 
to ensure that it also focuses on supporting child victims of trafficking that end up on the streets or in other exploitative conditions. Number four, that government prosecutes all perpetrators involved in aiding, abetting, and procurement of children for purposes of trafficking, forced labor, and slavery. Number five, that the Ministry of Internal Affairs effectively trains law enforcement officers in implementation of the Trafficking in Persons Act 2009. Number six, that we strengthen cross-border relationships to identify victims, do joint investigations and collaborations within the East African communities, take care of the children that find themselves in Nairobi. I beg to move. Thank you, Honorable Nakot Faith. Is the motion seconded? Seconded by Honorable Lanya Gilbert, uh, Aisha Kavanda, Teddy uh, Mapendusi, uh, Honorable Florence Wopa, Tom Bright, Perigo. Achayo, Abe, everybody. Would you love to speak to your motion? Yes, right, Honorable Speaker. Even now, when I've seen our one, don't worry. Colleagues, Even I'm... Moma is there. Thank you, colleagues, for supporting the motion. The justification for a motion seeking for a resolution of parliament, urging government to respond to the plight of farm young children who are enslaved in street begging and child labor. Right, Honorable Speaker, the issue of Karmaja's street children is not new to you and to all of us colleagues. Due to the nature of the activities on the street, particularly begging around traffic lights at the busy intersections, these children are highly visible, clearly living in extreme poverty and highly vulnerable. The public perception of these children is informed by an understanding of the drivers of poverty in Karamoja, as well as consideration of these children's humanitarian plight. As a consequence, the attitudes towards these children ranges from great sympathy to outright, outrightly hostility. Some people are hostile to these children. While there have been efforts to respond to the plight of Ugandan girls in the Middle East and other parts, the evidence suggests that little has been done to prioritize the internal trafficking of children from Karamoja, including those forced into begging and child labor. Nearly all victims of uh, this domestic and child trafficking are from Napak, nearly all. And I therefore thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for allowing me to table this motion on behalf of the people whom I represent in the house. The out migration to the street in, has not left anybody. There are children of chairmen, LC ones. There are children of, this, of, of councillors who have also found themselves in the street. Right, honorable speaker and honorable colleagues, there are a number of drivers, things that have forced these children to the street, but I will stick to two for now. One of them is perpetual scarcity of basic goods and services. You might be aware that the people of Karamoja rely heavily on livestock farming and small crops. They do small crop farming also. Every time when there is a missed season or when there is, or when there is an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, you will see the street full. It's, it becomes economic directly. So you'll find children moving to the street to survive. The other factor is the insecurity. And that is the reason why people have been asking why Napak, why not other districts? The insecurity is the easiest way to empty Karamoja. It is on record that the first migrants from Napak, it was Bokora County then, left in 1978, 79, 
when there was a war that led into the breaking of the Moroto Barracks Armory. And then our good, our good brothers got into the armory and helped themselves with the guns and decided to unleash it on the Bokora community. That was the first exit. Fortunately, the people who exited then did not go to beg. They went to look for what to do, work in other parts, including in Bunyoro. And the unfortunate bit is that they remained a link. They did not lose touch with home. So when the concept of going to beg became lucrative, there was an easy link because we already had our people living in other towns of Kampala and other cities. So it was an easy link. That is the reason why it is Napak and not any other district of this country. Unfortunately, right honorable speaker, as we speak now, the insecurity level in, in Karamoja has risen again. Last night, a number of people did not sleep in their homes. They had to sleep in schools and in hospital compounds. So when the people sleep in schools regularly, it frustrates efforts of resettlement. We will see the streets getting full with children and also with adults. Right upon Honorable Speaker, the state of Karamoja's children in Kampala and in Nairobi is alarming. Some have found themselves in Nairobi. Here in Kampala, our children are bundled up in small units, each paying rent of space for sleeping at a fee of 1,000 shillings per night. A room accommodating more than 30 children bundled up because the, the landlord wants to make more money. Therefore, these children are under obligation to beg in order to find money for renting a night's sleep and to give the boss, the person who brought you to the city to beg. Isn't this slavery in our time and in our watch? I have no idea how these children who are bundled up in one unit even survived COVID. I have no idea. Because of the booming business of renting space here in Kampala, the landlords have had to interest themselves in the area where these children come from. They now coordinate with parents, with middlemen, to ferry children in the bus, because the bigger the number of children you have in your house, the more the rent. That is what our children are going through here in Kampala, even today. Additionally, some of the children, especially the girls, who have found themselves in the streets of Nairobi, there is a report that some of them have lost their body organs. There is a girl from Lorikitai Parish in Lokopo sub-county in Apak district. She found her way to Nairobi. On the fateful day, she was allegedly given a drink. And the next time she woke up, she was in a hospital. And she got discharged. Nobody explained to her what happened. Later, she realized there was a wound by her side. She came back to Napak and she got she got sick and then she was taken to a hospital and they found that she had lost one of her kidneys. Unaware, the girl cannot be traced. She fled the family forever. Right, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Colleagues, I acknowledge the efforts so far put by government to rescue our children. The 10th parliament appropriated 3.4 billion shillings. And of that money, about 1 billion was released to the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Of this 1 billion shillings, only 38 million was sent to Napak district for surveillance. 38 million. 200 million went to FUFA. I don't know where the other money went. There have been FUFA, yes. There have been attempts to, to repatriate children back home, but the attempts have been failing. There have been some efforts, yes, by the Ministry of Gender and Social Development. We have the Kobulin Center. It is holding, it's a holding home for children returned from the street. However, some children are returned and accompanied at the age of five or even less. So they struggle to explain their ordeals. They even struggle to identify their, their true identity. It makes it difficult to resettle these children. 
So after holding, Koblin Center holds these children for a maximum of one week, and they are in a hurry to release them to the community. These children are released to the same community that sent them away. So they are rejected, and they find themselves back to the street. The older girls are trained. There is a success story. The older girls who are a little older, 14 years or so, children, are trained, skilled. They get trained in the Koblin Center for four months. After those four months, they are released to join the community. Unfortunately, they are released without any startup kit or package. So they struggle to find capital to fit in the community or to survive. Those children, uh, those girls have found themselves back in the streets of Nairobi looking for a living, even if we skill them. Right, honorable speaker, honorable colleagues, there is an issue of surveillance. It is a challenge. We have Napak Police Station. It has made some efforts to intercept traffickers and to intercept the children being moved from one area to the other whenever the bus passes that highway. From Iriri Police Post, they are doing a commendable job. However, there are many other exit routes in Napak. That's not the only one. The Karamoja is open. They can pass anywhere to access where they want to go. And those other areas are not attended to. As a district, Napak receives 4.5 million shillings per year for the entire social protection intervention. This money is received in installments or quarterly. That means it is 1.1 million per quarter. And when you divide it into 14 administrative units, it comes to 80,000 shillings per quarter. If this can handle gender-based violence, domestic violence issues of the elderly, how much will be available for surveillance of the children? How much? Sometimes we see traffic police here in Kampala standing one, one, one meter away from the children who are being subjected to slavery. The traffic, they, they are, these children are in the traffic area, those roundabouts. We'll see traffic police are there, but they have nothing to do. It has become a new normal. It has become, nobody, nobody seems to even know what to do. Nobody seems to care. In 2019, the media was awash with the news of our children being sold in the markets in Katakui and Ochorimongin market and Arapai markets. Children on sale. But it, it made news for some time and it ended in the news. When did we accept this as a new normal? This is broad day slavery of our children, of our children in our watch, and it is a new normal. And we are saying that we can rescue the Ugandans who are enslaved in the, in, in the Arab world, who are enslaved in other countries in the West, but we cannot rescue these ones who are enslaved in Uganda, who have to, who have to rent space every night. They cannot make a decision for themselves. Right, honorable speaker, these children, are, are, are victims of this level of violence, but yet we are treating them as criminals. When we, we, when we decide to bundle them up and throw them in trucks, we are treating them as criminals, yet they are victims. Napak District has attempted to form a bylaw. They drafted a bylaw to punish the parents who willingly give away these children or the people who are abetting this kind of work. They have attempted. Unfortunately, this, this bylaw has taken more than a year in the office of the Solicitor General. Their willingness to take action on these particular children seems to be slow. Now, if we do not take any action, if we watch it the way we've been watching, it is started with NAPAC. Now it is a Karamoja thing. The study report that I have that I will lay on table indicates that there are children from five other districts in Karamoja. And if we continue watching it as a Karamoja thing, it will extend to all your districts 
There is nothing special about the children of Karamoja that the children in the rest of the country do not go through. So if we care about children, we will first respond to this domestic trafficking and have these criminals apprehended. Fortunately, they are known. Even the landlords are known. The people connecting these children, the transporters of these children are also known. Even the parents are known who give away the children. Right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Colleagues, I kindly request you to support this motion so that we can come with an everlasting solution to the plight of our children who involuntarily have found themselves enslaved so that we can put a stop to the business of making our children goods being sold, to the business of, make, of, of enslaving our children. I don't know, speaker, I beg to move. I request Thank you me. allow me to lay a report from Moroto Catholic Diocese. This report informed the motion. If you allow me, I'll lay it. The report is yes, insights on the Karmajong children crisis, Napak district. Thank you, Faith. Seconda. The official seconder, the macho, honorable macho. Then the uh... Madam Speaker, and my colleagues, I want to thank Honorable, honorable Macho. You have only three minutes. Okay, Madam Speaker. With all appreciation to Honorable Nakut Faith Laro, the Human Member Parliament for NAPAC, for this motion. Madam Speaker, you see, being a gateway to Kenya, we have witnessed a lot of acts of child trafficking. Madam Speaker, many times in turn affairs, officer and team come to receive Karamojong children who were trafficked to Nairobi through Busia and Malaba. Madam Speaker, I'm standing to second this motion because truly NAPAC has suffered a lot. When you make research, Uganda is the first country in Africa with the highest child trafficking and it is the second in the whole of the world next to India. And the Karamoja subregion is the highest place in the whole of Uganda. When you visit Nairobi, almost 80% of children in Westlands, in Garissa, who are sold, come from Napak district. Yes, uh, proceed, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. In, uh, in his uh, maiden, uh, presiding over the house, right honorable Speaker Olanya got the house there, and yourself, Madam Speaker, you have eloquently been clear that every time we give a citation in terms of uh, statistics, statistics that is support a help us plan, we should give the relevant citation. Uh, my honorable colleague, I'm passionate and I fully support the motion. But as a scholar, and also somebody that tries to be guided by the leaders of this house to make the relevant citation. Madam Speaker, I don't know whether it's procedural right for us to sit here getting statistics that has not been cited in terms of source. What is the source of statistics? Uganda is the first country in the world. India is the second. Madam Speaker, are we procedural right to have 
these statistics part of our record of parliament without the relevant citation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Atkins. The move of the motion had already given the statistics of the flight of the children from Napak to, to wherever. She had given her figures. So it's more of giving in a qualitative analysis of what is this. You may not have to repeat with that. The fact is, eight and, eight, eight, what she said, 871 children live in a park, of which 561 are girls, written are boys. Where they end up is the question. And that's why the border person is saying that they see so many children cross over. He may not have the capacity to count how many have crossed or come back because it is an illegal activity. If it was a legal activity, you could go to the, to the reports and see this is a number that has crossed. Immigration has this number, but because it is an illegal activity, let's just know in the 10th parliament, remember we rescued some children who were taken to Nairobi, many. And the children were from Karamoja. And that's what the, the move of the motion is saying. So many children leave Karamoja. But this time around, she's only specific on her district, Napak, which we really need to take it seriously. When you move from here to Clock Tower, you may find over 100 of them. It's a serious matter. Bishop. But meanwhile, all come back to the house. Thank you. I am Madam. happy you stood up to make us know that you are around. Yeah, with the substance. But my only problem, Madam Speaker, is sauce. We are here for a specific time, but there are people that will come after us. I will, I'm, I'm interested in the source of information. And that's normal, Madam Speaker. Is it from the Minister of Gender, is it from UBOS or UDHS? I'm interested specifically. Is it from the National Council for Population? What is the source of information? That's very important. It Thank was you. laid on the table. The source is very available here, honorable member. If you need, it was from the, from the diocese, a very reputable organization and respected in the region. The source is there that can be used to in the future. If you're not in this house, anybody will come to this house or get that information and use it for further reference. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when I was still in primary one, at the integrated primary school, uh, we had the volunteer teacher called Rampel Stilty Skin. Rampel Stilty Skin made me fail P2 because he used to speak English in the North and I was not understanding any word at all. I therefore, Madam Speaker, I don't know what my colleague has talked at all. But however, <laughs> however, honorable members, to go back to second motion, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, almost, almost 7,000 to 12,000 girl children are in Kenya, sold from Karamoja subregion. We believe this exploitation is more than slavery, Madam Speaker, that I want to agree with the mover of the motion that we need bilateral collaboration to solve this problem. Because as I talk now, Madam Speaker, children are sold not only in Westlands, not only in the Kikomba markets of Kenya, and not only in Garissa, but even in Somalia. And the children who are sold in Garissa, Madam Speaker, the fatty girls are sold majorly for their organs to be removed and sold. The thin children are sold to work as suicide bombers. And this has been approved. Madam Speaker, I want to appreciate the minister, Honorable Peace Mutuzo. She has been an advocate 
And that's why I think the issue of children trafficking should, should be solved politically. Madam Peace has always been a mouthpiece for the children of Karamoja and Uganda at large. And secondly, Madam Speaker, since I'm saying we should solve this problem politically, that is why I request the head of state, my beloved president, that the Minister for Karamoja Affairs should be appointed from people of Karamoja. Because we are discussing this very important matter, no, no minister is here. No minister is here at all. Honorable, I am not being, macho, I am not being regional wise, but Madam Speaker, honorable, but Madam honorable Speaker. Macho, honorable Macho, the Minister of Children is here. I don't know, maybe because she's not a kid that you have not been able to see her. That's the Minister of Children. That's one. Two. Two. You cannot say that the Minister of Karamoja should be a Karamojo. Uganda is for all of us. Yeah, actually, the next Minister of Karamoja is going to be you. Madam Speaker, thank you for your guidance. And I want to uh, assure the ministers there that their jobs are secured, but I was talking about the Karamojong politics. Madam Speaker, as I summarize, I believe these children always are trafficked because, an, because of an issue of livelihood in Karamoja. Government should have a special strategic plan to solve this problem. And government should also involve the the parents of these children. That's why we need a special program for parenting of the Karamojong people, so that they have a mindset to make sure that they know the value and their responsibility as parents. Madam Speaker, as the move of the motion said, truly the Napaka District Child Protection Ordinance that has sat at the Solicitor General's office should be worked upon as quick as possible, because we believe this law will help our people to solve this problem of human trafficking, because it is a cartel. It, why we say it is a cartel? Every day, every month, children from Karamoja are being brought back in Busia and Malaba to be taken back to Napak. But it has never stopped, which means the atrocity is still going on. Lastly, Madam Speaker, I would request the government to interest itself so that these people who are carrying out the children trafficking should be named and ashamed because we have organizations like Willow International who have done a lot of research and even found out these people who are doing the human trafficking. I therefore, Madam Speaker, support this motion strongly by saying that if we protect the child of Uganda, we are protecting our next generation and Uganda will be a stronger country and again regain the name as a part of Africa. I therefore move, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much, Honorable Macho. Uh, John Bosco. Right, Honorable Speaker. Thank you so much for allowing me to second this motion. Moya John Bosco is my name. Uh, I, I, I am representing the people of Pokora in this uh, parliament. The issue of street children has been there for a while, and I'm glad that uh, Honorable Atikin has actually asked for reference. Mary Sundal, in 2007, produced a book and she has been staying with this community of uh, street children here in Katwe. Nowhere to go is the title of the book, Karamojong Displacement and Forced Resettlement. United States uh, Department uh, has also been able to do a lot of research um, on trafficking in persons, and you can also be able to look at that. Gekol, Wesley, and a team of others have also done research on the same. So you can still be able to help uh, our brother Macho, if you want to get the statistics and get uh, references. The street children phenomenon has been there for the last 15 years or more. And we are talking about bomb blasts the last two weeks. This bomb blast in Karamoja has been there for 15 years, 15 whole years. Many children have died in the process. Some have been returned and gotten lost in the process of return. And we are talking about that. We are talking about that. We are giving a face to that. Many a time you have come to parliament, you have seen these people out there begging. They are glaring, looking at us. And that is the future of Karamoja. That is the future of Uganda. What we have done is to trivialize this problem. 
to make it look like a Karamoja issue. In fact, we are worsened by calling it an APAC issue. These children are Ugandan. They are not Karamojong alone. They are not NAPAC children, they are Ugandans. And so that is why I want to appeal to you to look at that. Guess at them guessing at you, asking for an answer, asking for a future. It is a future of a whole lot of 15-year children who have actually been born in the street. And this is all generation, colleagues. It is all generation. We have about three sub-counties that have been affected in NAPAC. Lopei, Lokopo, and Matang. They are getting emptied into the streets. And just imagine for 20 years or 15, you have actually get, gotten people getting out. I'm not worried about voters, but I'm worried about them. That is why I want us to be able to look at this particular issue with more concern, with more care, because Karamoja is in Uganda. NAPAC is in Uganda. There are many fish factors, and I think Faze has already alluded to them. This particular problem started around 2001, when there was a disarmament, and many children were actually running away. It, it's a lot of insecurity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Honorable Speaker, this is a very touchy issue for me. I don't know if you would just allow one more. Yeah, it is touchy for everybody. Yeah, so we are, we are basically saying there are lots of push factors, and insecurity is one. Now, insecurity has actually assumed worse situations. Many people do not stay in their villages. They have started moving to the centers. And if you are talking about people coming to the streets, they come from the centers because they cannot be able to afford staying in a very insecure environment in the villages. And as I've already said, lots of credible information is out there. But it is us to be able to hold this particular crime, particular problem with both hands, not only the Karamoja issue, not only the NAPA issue, but all of us. And so it's my prayer, right, Honorable Speaker, that we actually educate these children. There should be an, a deliberate attempt to be able to educate these children, for them to be able to get some kind of future. The second appeal and prayer, Honorable Speaker, is that we start thinking about how to reintegrate, but also to resettle, in a manner that we are not dropping them, just like we are dropping rubbish. We should be able to deliberately think about how to deal with them when they return back home. Honorable Speaker, it takes a minute. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Bosco. That takes us to the issue of the bylaw, Honorable Minister, which you need to make a follow-up. In the bylaw, we should be able to apprehend the parents, irresponsible parents. And it all takes us back to parenting. The other day we were talking about parenting of the girl child. Takes us about parenting. You find somebody, as she talked, a kid is sold at 5,000 shillings. With the knowledge of parents. And when we talk about these children who are enslaved in the streets of Kampala and wherever, they are not only Karamoja children. They are from all over. Just because you can notice them talking, some of them talking Karamojong, that does not mean that they are only from Karamoja. You'll find some of them are from all your constituencies. So it's upon you and me to make sure that these children get out of the streets. You're proud of Uganda, part of Africa. The first impression the visitors get in Uganda are these kids in the street. Remember, first impression is lasting. You see the kid begging a tourist. Is that the tourism they have come for? The begging children? And I want to remind this house, in the last parliament, we had one of the bills which lapsed. And the bill was brought, was moved by Honorable Ariko Habat and seconded by Honorable Kunihira. I would possibly urge government or a private member to bring this bill on anti-slavery. This bill would help us to have an enabling law that would help us in a, what do we do in case there is, an, uh, there is slavery? How do we apprehend these people? 
and it would help the house and the whole country, not only NAPAC, as, as we are talking about this motion. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I stand to support the motion for the woman MP for NAPAC. Uh, right Honorable Speaker, as Parliament, we need to interest ourselves in knowing who these tra child traffickers are. Uh, right Honorable Speaker, it is so painful as a mother. Most times when we are driving around Kampala, in the streets of Wandegea, Kamo, Kiakatwe, even right now at Ginger Road, seeing young girls begging, children of five, four years, and little will you know, you even see babies being sat somewhere begging also, babies of even not less than a year, begging for what to eat, begging for monies, right honorable speaker. Right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Colleagues, most of these young girls have been impreg impregnated on the streets. They have been able to produce childless fathers, and some of them have been infected with HIV AIDS. And automatically, Madam Speaker, when some of these children will be told to go back to their homes, automatically they will refuse because they, they will be rejected by the communities where they came from. Right, Honorable Speaker, as I stand to support this motion. I pray that security together with local leaders in the different localities where these children are coming from, do start on a search, community search for every family. If at all, we know that such and such a family has been having 10 children, where are the rest, where have they gone? And if we so find that these parents are some of the those people who have been selling out children, they be convicted, they be charged, because this is real selling of human lives. How do a parent, a guardian, sell off a child's life? Then you again take another pregnancy of producing more children. For nine months, you bear the pregnancy only to sell to those ones who are trafficking. Right, Honorable Speaker, as I conclude, I do support the motion but also call upon Minister of Gender to come out strongly and do convict the culprits. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, this is a very, very important motion. Very important that it touches everybody. You find people giving their children to be carried by these people to start begging, a small kid begging. To me, I really feel we must know who are these people who go and collect these children. We must know the motive. And we must identify the parents who are culprits in selling the children. This motion is really supported by everybody in this house. True. My suggestion is for us to end this and have children out of the streets. We send this motion to the Committee of Gender, which will study this motion, and the committee should be able to identify for us the people who are selling children. There's a motion here. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Following your wise guidance and deliberations of honorable members, I would like to follow suit and move a motion that this house refers this matter to the Committee on Gender for exhaustive investigation and report back to the house. Thank you. Is the motion seconded? Seconded by everyone. Is the motion seconded? Yes. Honorable Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, right honorable speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I do second this motion. I did interface with the parents in Napak when they had the hepatitis E outbreak as Minister of State for Health then. So when we were in the field, one, that was one of the issues that we brought 
to the attention of the people, the LOCs. And do you know what they told us, together with the woman MP, that you people are living very well in Kampala, enjoying yourselves there. Our children, when we send them there, they send us money. And therefore, we cannot stop this. So, Madam Speaker, I do support this motion that we send this matter to the committee agenda so that they get to the bottom of this. When we talked about the motion on the girl child, remember this trafficking was one of the issues that was brought up by the member of parliament who seconded my motion. So, Madam Speaker, there must be a time frame. This is the amendment that I wanted to make. I do support that motion. We give the committee of gender, I think 30 days would be ideal so that they can report back with their report. Otherwise, if it's... No, 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 Members. 30 days is adequate. Thank you, right now. Members? No, let's be reasonable. Thank you, we'll right give, now. We'll give the committee two weeks. If they have not finished, they will come back and seek an yes. extension. This is a very crucial matter. These children are even insaturated to us. Because when they come and beg you and you don't give, they will hit your car because they are frustrated. I put a, a question that does in favor that we send this to a committee of gender yeah, with the amendment. Those in favor say and to the contrary, no. The eyes have it. Next. Motion. I am speaker, not chair, madam. Okay. Proceed, yes. Yes, uh, Honorable Aisha. Thank you. Kavanda. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I pray that you allow me. The eyes have it. She interrupted me. <laughs> I pray that you allow me propose an amendment. To the mother I motion. I have already Ma moved the motion. Madam, Honorable Kavanda. Madam Speaker, I beg Honorable, that I'm listening. Honorable to. Kavanda, there is a, a procedure of raising that again. What you can do, you'll take that procedure matter to the committee, your issue to the committee, and it will be adapted and reported to the House. Madam Speaker, my, my amendment was on the prayers that had been proposed by Honorable and original motion. Honorable Santa. Madam Speaker, Honorable Aisha is my friend and my member, but I feel constrained when the motion has already been passed for her to keep on insisting. You bring a fresh I motion. I was uh, rising on a procedural issue, whether it's procedural right for Honorable to keep on arguing, and yet she has been given a leeway to go to the committee. Honorable Kavanda, what you're raising is very important. You will take to the committee and it will be considered at committee level. Uh, there is a motion seeking leave. Item A. seeking leave. Motion seeking leave of parliament to introduce a private member's bill. Honorable Muma, you have something to say? Uh, thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I was raising on an issue of uh, procedure whereby the most. Um, uh, your MP is asking me if I can allow you to go. Please, thank you for coming. Come again. Greet the people of Napak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, Honorable Speaker, the procedure matter I was raising was in view of the minister in charge, children and youth affairs, because she labored to come and uh, say something about the motion. I think it would be courteous of this house for us to give her chance you remember one of the members was even alluding that there was no member, from, no minister from gender. So I would do. Honorable member, with a due respect, the minister will go to the committee and present her issues. And I also defended the minister that the minister was here. So uh, she did not labor really uh, to do that. She came to do her 
legislative duty of being in the house. Honorable Minister, you will go to the committee and present, but thank you for, for being there for children. Honorable Peace, you've been praised by, by Smagola. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Sarah. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, this is a motion seeking leave of Parliament to introduce a private member's bill entitled the Surrogacy and Assisted Reproductive Technology Act 2021. Whereas Article 79 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda empowers Parliament to make laws on any matter of peace, order, development, and good governance, and whereas Rule 120 and of the Rules of Procedure grants every member the right to move a private member's bill. Further, whereas Article 33 of the Constitutional Imperative of Government is to ensure that the welfare of women and men is enhanced to enable them to realize their full potential, aware that as per the Ministry of Health, one in every four couples in the country is affected by infertility, while 10 to 15% of couples in the country cannot have children as a result of infertility caused by various, uh, various uh, issues like this sexually transmitted infections, overconsumption of alcohol, poor nutrition, environmental factors, and diabetes, appreciating that the biotechnological advancements of surrogacy and fertility treatment in the practice of medicine have made it possible that notwithstanding absence of malformation of the womb, recurrent pregnancy loss or repealed IVF, IVF is, is in vitro fertilization, implantation failures, and a woman who desires to enjoy her age Age old maternal and God given heritage of childbearing can do so. Concerned that there are many IVF clinics operating in the country currently and providing fertility care and surrogacy services, but with no regulation of or government supervision to guarantee the quality of service and promote ethical medical conduct. Noting that the practice of surrogacy and fertility treatment has an attendant legal ethical and social issues that include attribution of maternity between a biological and uterine mother in case of mistaken implantation, execution and implementation of gestational agreements and myriad of many other complications, including death resulting from gestational surrogacy, Further noting that the practice of surrogacy and fertility treatment is now on the rise in Uganda, and yet surrogacy remains unregulated, unregulated, notwithstanding the importance to set up laws that will regulate the practice for the better protection of the parties involved and for the orderly development of this medical field, and to offer legal and state-sanctioned reprieve to couples that are battling with infertility problems Considering that the lacuna in this practice of the medical field calls for enactment of a regulatory framework to guide the orderly advancement of medical field and Uganda as a society. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this house grants me leave to introduce a private member's bill for an act entitled the Surrogacy and Assisted Reproductive Technology Bill 2021, a draft of which, Right Honorable Speaker, is here to attach and do order the publication of the said bill in preparation for the first reading. I beg to move. Thank you so much, Honorable Sarah. Is the motion seconded? Is the motion seconded for introduction of I'm seeking, seeking leave of parliament to introduce a private member's bill? Is it seconded? Seconded by Dr. Bukenya Atkins. Hey. Seconded by Achen Dokas, by Mary uh, Santa, and Raul. 
Dr. Asimwe, yes, would you love to speak to your motion? Two minutes. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, the freedom to procreate or not is a fundamental right of every adult above 18 years. And therefore, those facing challenges need to be assisted. We all know, Right Honorable Speaker, that in Uganda, it was Professor Edward Tamalesali who started the fertility clinic over 10, 15 years now. And since then, there are so many clinics offering fertility services in the country. Secondly, Right Honorable Speaker, they are busy mothers, also women with challenges with their wombs that have gone into surrogacy. Surrogacy is when you hire another person or somebody to carry your baby for you. And this service, Right Honorable Speaker, is being offered currently. Right Honorable Speaker, there are also donors who donate their sperms and eggs to the various fertility clinics. We are also aware that the government constructed a specialized women's hospital at Mulago, and it is supposed to be offering, it's the, actually the first public fertility clinic in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Most of these clinics are actually private. So government constructed this hospital that is supposed to be offering this service. And also aware that WHO recognizes infertility as a disease. It's a public health issue that requires support. And right honorable speaker, because of these issues, there is completely no law in place to regulate these services that are being offered here. And for this right honorable speaker, it's the reason, briefly because of time I have stopped there, it's for this, in order for us to have a law in place to regulate not only the donors, but also these fertility, the doctors, the physicians who are engaged in this. We don't want to move that somebody has gone to a clinic, a fertility clinic, to seek for services, and tomorrow we find. Honorable Musasizi, somebody resembling Honorable Musasizi on the street, and when they do a DNA, it is his son. And yes, and yet the, the, the sperm was merely, was used without his permission. So there is a need for regulation, right on our speaker. <laughs> there is need to regulate this so that the donors are protected, so that even the children born out of this are protected. So right yeah. honorable speaker, Thank you. I beg to submit. Thank you, honorable, honorable Wopa. When, when that uh, hospital was operationalized, were you not a state minister of uh, health? Right honorable speaker, it's the reason why I'm here because I did champion the legislation. And when I left for the last three years, nothing has come out. And this is why I'm moving. No, I just members. wanted to know that, or is it operating without any regulation, any enabling law? Right honorable speaker, they have trained experts. Uh, allow me to say this, that certain times they are movers in a ministry. They are people who are passionate about things and they move things. Allow me to say that this fertility clinic specifically is not functioning as it should be. Despite government training, okay. the experts in India and other countries, they are there actually not being fully utilized. Okay, thank yes, you. Thank you, right Dr. Bukenya. Yes, uh, thank you, right honorable speaker. Right honorable speaker and members, I'd like to support the motion that has been moved by the Honorable Member Sarah Pendy. As she has talked about the extent of the problem, that 15% of Ugandan couples are suffering infertility, and actually contrary to what people think, 50% are men. Thank you yeah. very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Bokenya. Madam Speaker, the procedural matter I want to raise is whether it wouldn't be proper for Dr. Bokenya to declare his 
interest first before seconding this matter, because I'm aware that he is actually one of the doctors with clinics that is already performing the, the subject matter we are discussing here. So would it be fair that you first declare your interest and then we can benefit from your experience of uh, running psych? Thank you. Honorable Speaker, I'd like uh, to thank my brother. I thought I was to rule the problem. You see, one of the ways of marketing yourself is speaking about it. So if uh, he's one, he owns one of the clinics, so he's basically marketing what he does, and maybe he's the right person to give us information on what happens. Uh, thank you for the ways, Rosing, right, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but, uh, but, but you can still tell us if briefly, you own. Briefly, I'm a trained gynecologist obstetrician, and with also a special training with fertility treatment. And uh, before I came here, I used to do fertility treatment. And even a few of my colleagues consult me. Did so you, I'm still practicing. Did you also treat you? I, I'm not allowed to disclose whether it's one of them. <laughs> but uh, I was mentioning that 50%, contrary to what is known, 50% of the problem is contributed to by men. But there is need for treatment, that one we all agree. And like, and like my sister has mentioned, there are more than 10 fertility treatment centers in the country, which are private. And government is yet to operationalize its unit. We provided money this financial year. But there is no regulation, despite the fact that this is a profession that involves third parties, like she has mentioned, where you have a sperm donor, you have an egg donor, you have um, a surrogate mother. So it needs to be regulated uh, in order to avoid problems since it involves third parties. Finally, I, want to, don't, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I would like to ask members to support the private member who has offered to assist government to come up with a law that is to regulate this practice. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, clarification. Right Honorable Speaker, uh, as a traditionalist, I want, I, I'm seeking clarification. I think it's important to understand because I'm, I'm try, I've tried to understand the motion and I know where we are coming from because there are people who have challenges they are married, but they cannot have a child. So definitely, they should be facilitated. However, when I reflect back to my Bible, it's in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, the Bible says, And God, on the sixth day, decided, Let us make man in our image. So now, when you borrow, borrow, when you borrow egg or borrow sperm to produce a child, I hope at the end of the day we will not end up with difficulties in claiming whose child this is. I know that uh, uh, Abraham tried by using the the house helper to give a child called Ismail. But it caused Sarah a problem, your namesake. So I, I just want to be clarified and comforted that uh, when such a thing comes, you will not bring us a storm which we will not be able to handle. There will be religious crisis, there will be traditional crisis, like a person like me. If you come to me now and tell me you are going to hire a womb, I will, uh, I will say if, if, uh, if, if you marry a woman and the woman has not given in one year or two years, traditionally you marry another one and you produce a child through that wife. That, that is my tradition. I come from Lango. That's what we do. That if, uh, if the child, the woman you are married has failed to give you a child, 
you marry another one. So that, that child being produced to a second wife, you can name them as if they are your children and you take care of them. So I'm hoping that this new side technology you are bringing will not class with my traditional interests. So that's the clarification speaker. I'm just ignorant because of my background. I come from a different age group and therefore I also have to protect the interests of my group. So can I be clarified that uh, mm. it will not wreck my, my understanding of what reproduction is all about? You know, you know, these laws are not cast on stone. And uh, the motion that is before us is merely seeking leave. We are not going to debate the substance of the motion. What the member wants, what Matt is raising is very crucial, especially with her age now. Yeah? It is a very crucial matter, the culture, the religion, the age. Th that is very, very crucial. But that will come when we are debating the motion. For now, what the member is asking is leave. I now put a question that the member be given leave to introduce a private member's bill. Let's grant a member a private to, to bring to the house a private member's bill to introduce a, a, a bill entitled the surrogacy and assisted technology bill. I put the question, those in favor say aye, and those to the contrary, no. Aye. The eyes have it. So Sarah, go and prepare your bill and bring it to the house. We adjourned the house to 2 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you. 